for those of you who don't know the law of ygo is a yugi tuber who uh the, the the premier content that i watch from them is their their his, historic yugioh videos um and the link to the video that we're watching right now is is in chat and i'm gonna pin it real quick and um it's a pretty in-depth nostalgic look at past years in Yu-Gi-Oh! and we are now up to 2013 and i love to watch these because i've been there and it makes me very very um it makes me very nostalgic so i like that okay so let us let me pause the music and we go into 2013 off the top of my head even before we go in 2013 obviously the year of the dragon rulers the spell books as you can see in the thumbnail which is really all that i remember from it i think early 2013 should be mermail format like i think we start the format with mermails early 2013 mermail and then we move into into dragon rulers and spell books i think is the timeline that i remember and as per usual because these videos are very long and i like to take a pause at some point at some point let me put it to like let's 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 do 1.25 so we don't sit here for a shift in the meta literally that had been two hours for the past year was starting to creep in though a majority of the year had been dominated by the triangle format decks abyss rising at the tail end of the year brought a new competitor to the table in mermail yeah. which appeared to be poised to challenge the long-standing champions of the metagame this led us into the first set of the year would this be a time format you'd like to see uh we can talk about that more later however I think the problem, I actually think it would be, it's cool to play Dragon Ruler spellbook matches these days, but I think in general, a rule of thumb for a format that would make for a good Time Wizard format, it needs more decks than two. Because even if you like a certain format, and I've noticed this with playing Necroz Mirrors or something like that, um, I've gone back to play Necroz Mirrors with friends and, and stuff like that. The problem is two decks or one deck only, it just gets stale. It gets stale. Even if the mirror match, the mirror match can be so good, it doesn't matter. Like at, at some point, you're just sick and tired of playing the same match over and over and over again, right? Like spellbook against dragon, dragging it against dragon, or spellbook against spellbook. I think it's it it's cool to revisit like once, but I think it wouldn't make for a good time wizard format, no, because eventually we would get tired the of the water it. threat we've been needing. The next set would bring the fire to combat it. Uh, Cosmo spellbook Blazer, support, yeah, date, Cosmo Blazer. January 25th, 2013. Set type, oh, set. dude, Major strategies. No Cosmo delight. Blazer is such a cool set, it has so many cool cards in it. Diamond Direwolf is one of my favorite exceeds ever made. That Fire card Fist, is so cool. Mermail. Impact the fire to Mermail's water. Cosmo Blazer would kick the year off with a core set focused on introducing a new fire archetype to the game to help combat the powerful Mermails introduced last set, while also bringing waves of support for previously introduced archetypes to help boost their playability into the metagame. The new archetype was Fire Fist, a series of fire beast warriors centered around their interactions with the Fire Formation series of continuous spells and traps. This first wave gave us Bear, who sets a Fire Formation spell from deck when he deals damage and can send a Fire Formation spell trap to grave to pop a monster on field. Gorilla, who sets a Fire Formation spell from deck when it destroys a monster in battle, able to send a fire formation spell trap to grave to pop a spell or trap dragon who sets a fire formation trap from deck when a fire formation spell trap is activated and can send two fire formation spell traps to grave to revive a fire fist tiger king a beast warrior locked rank four that sets a fire formation spell trap from deck on summon can detach to negate all non-beast warriors on field until the end of the turn it really is crazy with how much power the fire fist cards came right out of the first pack like they had most of their important cards immediately i feel like the only deck that wasn't a thing yet was the the three axes version but the four axes had pretty much everything immediately right like they got they got only very minor support later for the level four ones i think like they got more exceed monsters like i think cardinal i want to say was not out yet and when sent to grave can send three fire formation spell traps to grave to summon two lower level beast warriors with the same attack from deck all of the fire formation spells and traps share an effect to boost beast warriors attacks by a value while face up being 100 for spells and 300 for traps with each having an additional effect with tanky searching a lower level beast warrior on activation. Was, yeah yeah that's why i'm saying most of the three axis stuff was later like spirit chicken horse sprints actually horse sprints i think is cosmo blazer but it wasn't good yet tensu giving an additional normal of a beast warrior every turn tensen boosting a beast warrior by 700 that turn on activation and Tenken negating a Beast Warrior's effects, but making it immune to cards other than... This card was busted at the sneak peek, by the way. Broken-ass card at the sneak peek. I played one sneak peek. I think I had a... I pulled a super rare dragon and two or three Tensin. It was Jover. 
itself on activation. It was Jolder. We also received a few more pieces in the OCG import slots, being Horse Prince, a level 6 sinker that summons a level 3 fire yeah, protect on sinker yet. summon, Lion Emperor, a fire locked rank 3 that can detach one to recur a fire from grave to hand, and Spirit, a level 3 tuner oh, that Spirit revives a level out, 3 okay. 200 yeah, or less wasn't. defense fire on normal summon. Fire Fist gave a solid introduction wave here, but was clearly being pulled in two different directions, being a rank 4 focused deck between Bear, Gorilla, and Tiger King, and a level 3 strategy with Spirit, Lion Emperor, and Horse Prince. It feels like a very odd thing when you think about it. The fact that Fire Fist was supposedly the same archetype, but it was going into two very different directions, right? You had to... They, they didn't really go together, right? It was either you play level 3 Fire Fist or you play level 4 Fire Fist, which I feel like on the one... It's a cool concept, isn't it? Like, I mean, of course, on, on the one hand, it's kind of... It, it's weird that you have two cards of the same archetype that don't work together, right? That's kind of something that doesn't make sense. But at the same time, it's kind of a cool idea that you can take one archetype, but you can take it two completely different directions. Um, I can't really think of many other... I can't really think of many other decks that or archetypes that would work in a similar way. Because, like, most archetypes are designed to all be put into the same deck, while this one is, like... Nah, you have to either play four or three. Like, you can't play both. Uh, it was like, I think the three axis deck played like maybe one bear or something like that. Maybe even three because bear was just that good. But in general, it was just all the level threes or all the level fours. Prince. Though notably, even though there were other level three fire fists in the set, there were currently no in archetype monsters that Spirit could revive other than another copy of itself. Because of this split in focus, two different versions of fire fist would be created, known as three axis and four axis, named for which level that version focused on, with four axis being the only playable version at this stage, heavily relying on Bear to do the heavy lifting of the deck as clearly the best main deck piece. In addition to this, Tanky would move to see play outside of fire fist as well due to effectively being a beast warrior. I mean, Tanky's just filling broken. a niche no other card really had filled at that stage. Stage, and would continue to see play in any Beast Warrior focused deck for a long period of time after. Moving into archetypes that receive new support, Noble Knight is the first TCG exclusive archetype that has technically been around for some time at this stage, seeing roughly one to two cards per core set released since Galactic Overlord. Noble However, Knight was such a most of their cards deck around seem completely disjointed from each other thus far. This set would introduce their first decent wave of support to give the strategy an actual direction to move in. So let's talk about it. Noble Knight Madrot is a level 4 light warrior that becomes a level 5 dark warrior while equipped with a Noble Arm spell, and can, if equipped, summon a Noble Knight from deck and pop its equip spell, which triggers the float effect of the Noble Arm spells. In addition to this... If I remember correctly, the entirety of, of Noble Knight at the time revolved around Medrod. Like, if you didn't open Medrod, the deck didn't really do anything. And if it opened Medrod, it was just about making... What was it? What was the Exceed that you wanted to, to make? Was it Artorigus and equip it with a bunch of equip spells and make it, like, hard to out? Noble Arms Caliburn boosts the equipped monster I think by that 500, was the, can the, boost the, the controller's deck, life points by 500 on a soft once per turn, and when destroyed, can re-equip itself to a Noble Knight on a hard once per turn. Lastly, Artorgus, King of the yeah, Noble Knights, is a Noble guy. Knight locked rank 4 that, yeah. on Exceed Summon, equips up to three Noble Arms from Grave to yeah, himself, yeah, yeah, yeah. and can detach the, the pop spells and traps the on the field up to the number of Noble Arms equipped to himself. Noble Knight at this stage is still far from being considered a meta contender, but this would be the first wave of support for the deck to be considered a good direction for the strategy, being held back by the lack of good Noble Arms spells and the it lack of good definitely wasn't good, but people mess around with it. This Merle was would... this was the first time that people actually messed around with the deck. They they wouldn't actually they wouldn't do very well, but they would try it, you know. Also see a solid second wave of support here in Abyssdine, able to summon herself if search while you control a mermail, able to revive a level three or lower mermail if summoned by a mermail effect. Abyss lead, able to summon itself from hand oh by God, Abyss three lead. other waters, able to recur an Abyss spell trap engraved to hand on summon, and can rip a card. Megalo discard lead and gunned. Holy! From the opponent's hand by tributing another mermail. Abyss trite, a three material rank three that can detach to change an effect target to itself and revive a mermail on destruction. Bahama and Abyss shark, a TCG summon exclusive trite. that can summon itself by discarding another one. This was uh. For all you Zoomers out there, this used to be the best card to summon off of Bahama shark before they made Toad. This was very. It was very good. Because Mermail had this very cool interaction, and I actually do mean cool, that might made me that sounded ironic, but I wasn't being ironic. Where like all the Atlanteans say if they if they are sent for cost to activate a water effect, they trigger, right? And the thing you would do is if that also counted if they were detached as exceed material, because that is paying the cost for a water effect, right? So if you made Dweller or Bahama Shark with Dragoons. And then you detached uh, Dragoons, you would get the search, right? So that was one of your main uh, ways to do it was like you would uh, try to overlay a Dragoon into a Bahamut Shark or a um, Dweller, right? And detach that Dragoon to get a search.
water and searches a mermail when summoned this way. This wave would fill the in archetype void in terms of swarming, especially for level 3 and 7s with Dine and Tia specifically. With Tia being an absolutely insane piece of support to boost the deck up further into the meta with both its easier summon. Dude, you know what's funny? Abyss Tias in the beginning didn't see any play because you have to think about the timeline here. We've watched this towards the end of the 2012 recap, right? Just to put this into into perspective, like the the current iteration of Mermail Atlantean before this pack was centered around um they would their normal summon would usually be Genex Undyne to send dragoons for cost to search any sea serpent, and it was heavily centered around like Abyss Megalo, Abyss Sphere, Abyss Lind, and all that kind of stuff. But they didn't actually lean very hard into the Mermail direction. It was more like a Abyss Megalo Turbo deck. Uh, and that meant that for Abyss Tears, because it searches level 4 lower Mermails only, like, it didn't seem that great in the beginning. Like, everyone was like, okay, I can search Abyss Pike, but I want to normal summon Undyne, rather. Right? Uh, it took a while... And I think the 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 huge. I mean, we're probably going to talk about this in a second. But the people that pioneered a deck that was then later on known as Mono Mermail, which was a very confusing name because it wasn't Mono Mermail. It wasn't just Mermails, but it, it still played the Atlanteans. I don't know why it was called Mono Mermail. Don't ask me. But um, the the people that pioneered the Mermail deck using a, a much heavier Mermail count, including like Abyssius, was I think Billy Break was the main one. And it may also have been Jeff Jones a little bit. I'm not sure. Maybe it was both of them in equal pieces. Maybe it was more Jeff Jones. But I think Billy Brake and Jeff Jones were the first ones to pioneer uh, a deck that was then called Mono Mermail. Which, honestly, I remember entering my first tournament with Mono Mermail after having played regular Mermail for a while. And I, I, I remember thinking to myself, dude, this deck is so much more broken than regular Mermail. This deck is so good. I won that tournament, I think, undefeated. Uh, it was like, a, I think it was called, I don't know what they called it back then, one of those state championships they had in Europe. Uh, and it was like, that deck felt so, f so good. It was so good. Tears was such a powerful card, man. Piccolo and its search on summon. In addition to this, Trike gives the archetype a good target to summon using Bahamut Shark, which was always an option for the deck to make, but lacked a solid target to summon. This is the, the, this is the time of the video where he says everything I just said, and you sa you spam pre-watched, by the more way. More of a threat in the metagame than it already was, which we'll see soon enough. Prophecy would receive a couple of new pieces, with the most notable being Master, able to copy the effect of a normal spellbook and grave as long as you control at least one spellcaster on the field and can reveal another spellbook in hand, allowing the chain that began with Blue Boy and Secrets to continue further, allowing spellbook decks to get additional counters onto Star Hall and additional names into the grave for fate. Diamond Dire Wolf is a new rank 4 staple piece that can pop a tri-type of control cool and a card the opponent controls, able to pop itself with this effect, becoming the go-to rank 4 removal option. Lightning Chidori I mean, is this was basically just the uh, Xyz version of Scrap Dragon, right? They've made that kind of card for, I want to say, almost every single summoning mechanic, right? Because even for Link monsters, you have you have cards that do that, like, for example, Donner for Hire, right? Like, they're, they've made this... You, I can destroy this card, like, my, I can destroy myself to pop one of your opponent's cards for a lot of, uh, like, for all, almost all the summoning mechanics, I want to say, Lock which is pretty cool. That spins a set pretty card cool. to the bottom of the deck on summon, and can detach to stack a face-up card on top of the deck. An insanely powerful option for wind decks, though there were none in the meta at the time. Yep. Crimson Blader is a level 8 OCG import synchro oh, that, God, if it a monster in battle, locks the summoning of high-level monsters from the opponent the following turn, which, while not useful on release, will become extremely relevant within the next few months. Yep. Breakthrough Skill is a trap that negates the effects of a face-up monster I turn. love. Then it can be banished from grave I on your love turn, breakthrough turn. skill, man. This card was so good. I've negated so many abyss dwellers with this card. Oh, this card was phenomenal. Put there to do it again, becoming a solid option for multiple monster. I think this card. I think the last time I've played this card in like a big tournament was probably. I think I won. Didn't I? I, I think I won YCS proc with this in the side deck for Paleo to negate Denko because you can send it off Morella as a Denko out. I'm pretty sure I played that effect stuns. All in all, Cosmo Blazer, is while not being a meta years later. set, did many things right in pushing the meta slightly in a new direction, complemented by the structure deck release that came two weeks later. Ooh, Fire Kings. Onslaught of the Fire Kings. Release date, February 8th, 2013. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Fire King. Impact, another fire archetype, not nearly as relevant. Onslaught of the Fire Kings was the fire structure deck counterpart to last year's Atlantean water structure deck, and as such, it introduced the Fire King archetype, a series of tri-typed fire monsters who were designed to be spiritual successors okay, to Okay, so Sacred I don't Phoenix remember the exact timeline on this, but I definitely remember 
we're probably going to talk about this in the video. There's a ban list coming up soon, I think before Dragon Rulers. And after that ban list, I played Fire King. And that deck was pretty fun. It wasn't like the best deck in the format or anything. But after that next ban list that is about to happen, I think, if I remember correctly, after that ban list, Fire King was actually a, a viable deck. Um, I think there's a ban list coming up and then Fire I played Fire King after that. For With their boss monster, High Avatar Garunix, having an almost identical effect, reviving itself the turn after it's destroyed by card effect, nuking all monsters on the field when it did. In addition to him, Barong could search for a the Fire deck King was card the turn dope. after it's destroyed by a card effect. Onslaught of the Fire King lets you, if you control no monsters and the opponent does, summon a Fire Tri-Type from deck, destroying it in the end phase, and Circle lets you pop a Fire on field to revive a Fire in Grave, giving you easy access to Garonix as well as the original Nethys with most of the enabling support. Unfortunately, the deck as it stood, while explosive, was extremely telegraphed and delayed in its impact, relegating the strategy to simply a rogue option for the time being. Reprints here included Sacred Phoenix of Nephthys, Manticore of Darkness, Rekindling, and Pot of Duality, with the Duality reprint being a solid inclusion for deck sales. YCS Miami would be held the next weekend, and Windup would once again reclaim its spot as top deck in the meta, including first place piloted by Travis Smith. Oh, Relantian this was still was a shock right master. Though in yeah. representation, with a few players notably cutting Gen X Undyne from the list due to finally hitting that key point of enough good Mermail names to no longer need it, although a couple would still play it. Firefist would see its first top cut appearance here, notably playing Rescue Rabbit to access Vorse Raider for the Tiger King push, which would be iterated on Vorse in the coming Raider. weeks to instead be Gene Warped Warwolf, the strongest Beast Warrior normal monster. YCS Bokum would be held a week later, and while Windup would oh, once again Alpe pick the King's that. Slice, as well as the top spot yep. piloted by Alpe in Gene, Firefist's popularity in the EU was a completely different story from its original performance stateside, with three different variants popping up, being the Rabbit variant we saw last week, a stun variant playing Beast King Barbaros, who could be boosted with the fire formations, and even a Fire King variant, utilizing the Fire King spell traps to access Bear, Gorilla, and even Flamel Fire Dog. Wasia Santiago would be held the same weekend, and if the US was leaning Mermail and the EU was leaning Fire Fist, then South America I think, was... I think if anything out of 2013 could become a... Um a what's it called time wizard format i think it would be fire water format which i think is there's a ban list coming up i'm very certain now there's a ban list coming up that kills wind up after that it's like the, is is what people refer to as fire water wait no fire water is 2014 why is it am i completely misremembering right now is there why are people referring to fire water as 2014. Firewater is YCS Berlin. Was YCS Berlin 2014? Oh, I see. Okay, my bad. Never mind. Leaning towards Macro Rabbit, being the most popular deck of the event, taking first place piloted by Jose Raul. Macro Cosmos tended to have a significantly positive matchup with the various decks in the format. Dude, due it's to most a long time ago. Cut me some slack. Either their main play lines or heavier recursion pieces, giving Macro it's Rabbit a, a long good field to play against for this event specifically. Following the opening YCSs of the year, the ban list would be updated on March 1st, bringing a fairly small number of changes, but without question being impactful ones. Newly banned were Sangan, a targeted hit at both its generic search ability as well as tour guide, and Windup Carriers and Mighty, effectively crushing the best extra yeah. deck monster in archetype okay. for windups, but the hits would keep coming. Newly limited were Windup Magician, killing the board flooding of the deck as now you needed more gas than ever to access Shockmaster, One Day of Peace, heavily crippling the extension of alt wincon decks, and Solemn War. Meadowlands is Meadowlands format or Meadowlands format is the format people look at for Time Wizard. Oh, that's the one that Tyree won, right? Is that coming up next? I know Tyree won a YCS with, with Mermail. Uh, that must be the one after this YCS then, right. uh, after this ban list then? The Solemn Brigade, as it was referred to, now matching its counterpart of Judgment. Newly semi-limited were Ryo, nerfing stun strategies fairly hard, Tsukiyomi, bringing back the GOAT format staple, and Advanced Ritual Art, as the Demise OTK was effectively gone for good now. Lastly, Unlimited were Kalut, Lumina, Minecrush, Spore, and Sheen Smoke Signal, all cards for decks of previous metagames that were, in fairness, mid for the current space. This particular ban list target was clearly wind up, I mean, wind and the two just targeted hits died, of the deck man. landed powerfully, taking the meta powerhouse almost completely wind out of the Wind up just scene, died. They didn't even need to hit wind up Magician, strategy. probably. At this time, we also received a couple of side releases that would mostly do nothing to the metagame, starting with Star Pack 2013 on March 1st, which changed <laughs> dude, nothing at all, followed by Zexo... Star Pack, dude! What the hell was a Star Pack? I remember that this was so weird of a pack. What did they think with the Star Packs, dude? Collection 10 on March 8th, which oh, did bring man. two new useful exceeds to the meta and Star Liege Paladino. So Star Packs, for anyone that wasn't around, was like, it was just this weird pack that had like, I want to say five cards in it, but they were really cheap, like two bucks or something like that. Uh, and they had some reprints, but nothing really good in them. But they introduced a new rarity 
that just looked like it just had some sprinkles on it, like some stars on the thing. It was nah, man. It was three cards. It was even just three cards. God damn. I okay. Well, it, maybe it was three. I don't remember, but it was it was not. It was not great. The rarity didn't even look good. It didn't even look good because Starfoil is basically just a common with some stars on it. Four option for light strategies and number 61 Volcasaurus, a new staple in the rank five slot. The first testing grounds of this new metaspace would be YCS Austin on March 23rd. And with windup almost completely gone, taking only one spot in the top cut here, Mermail was left to completely dominate the space, taking 15 of the top 32 in addition to first place piloted by Oscar Zelaya, showcasing the current version of the deck, which had completely eliminated the Gen X package. Yeah, this, was, this is this is the first this is this this deck is this deck is peak. This deck is so powerful, man. This deck is so good. It's so clean. No, no more drawing Genix controller either, and it's even stronger than before. This thing showcasing so, the current so version nice. of the deck, which had completely eliminated the Genix package. Girgia would begin to see some movement here with Windup out of the picture, still utilizing Machina for instant threats of Fortress or the Karakuris for access to Synchro Seven and Eight pools. Probably the most interesting deck taking a spot here was the Electrum OTK, a newer OTK development that oh, required just two that. parts that to pull was off, nasty. being Fusion Gate and Chain Material. By that deck was nasty, nasty. Using Chain Material, you can fuse using materials in the deck and grave for the entire turn by banishing them, which meshes well with Fusion Gate, allowing you to fuse as many times as you want in a turn. Allow so what was the... the OTK was... How would you recycle Gustav Max? I forgot. I think it was a Gustav Max loop, but why would that go back into the deck? Oh, Electromite itself. Shuffle all banished cards into... Yeah, okay, okay. Allowing you to fuse for Elemental Hero Electrum, who shuffles all banished monsters into deck on Fusion Summon, allowing you to make a second, shuffle again, yeah, overlay yeah, yeah. the two for Gustav Max, burn for 2,000, fuse the Gustav in the grave the Electrum for Gaia, the Gaia in the second Electrum for Shining, and then make a third Electrum to shuffle back all the materials to do it again, burning for game after four loops. YCS San Diego would be two weeks later on April 6th, though a disclosure needs to be made about the top cut breakdown here. Prior to Top 32, players played using a Battle Pack Epic Dawn sealed draft deck meaning that just because a deck is in the top cut here doesn't mean that the deck made it through by its own merit. Angel Essentio would take the event on... That was mail. such a hype concept too. In Swiss, it was draft. In top cut, you had to bring a different deck. It was weird, to be fair, because you still had to bring a full deck, but just for top cut. I kind of liked it. I, I kind of preferred uh, when they did a full uh, sealed YCS from start to finish, but this was still cool. To be expected due to the deck's popularity and power in the current format. Last event from this block was YCS San Jose two weeks later, and from the top 16, we'd see Firefist taking a split of the representation from Mermail, with Bear Control builds taking center stage, using the remainder of the Firefist pieces to effectively get yourself to Bear. Jorge Valverde would take the event on Bubble Beat, showcasing the deck's ability to continue topping despite its hits from late 2012 by accessing bursts of power through Blade Armor Ninja and Absolute Zero. This would lead into the next hit. Hey, was Marshall that a DN screenshot? What the hell? What kind of throwback was that? And although the last couple had been quite underwhelming in the grand scheme, this one was set to upend all preconceived notions of failure. Oh, Hidden Arsenal. What is that, 7 already? Hidden Arsenal 7, yeah. Night of the Stars. Release date, April 26th, 2013. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, Constellar, Evil Swarm, Extra Deck Staples. Impact, <laughs> and upheaval of the rank 4 pool. Hidden Arsenal 7 would be the final standalone Hidden Arsenal set for a long period of time, and the series was not about to just sit back and die quietly. It was set to go out with a massive bang by not only introducing two new strategies to the meta, but also by completely revolutionizing the generic exceed pool by giving most archetypes from the last couple of sets a generic exceed that did something uniquely powerful. Starting with Gem Knights, they wouldn't receive an exceed like most of the others, but would receive a couple of new key cards for later impact, like Lazuli, who adds a normal monster from grave to hand when sent to grave, Seraphonite, a fusion of a Gem Knight and a light monster that can provide an extra normal summon each turn, and hmm. Master Diamond, a fusion of three Gem Knights that can banish a lot- Surely Seraphonite would never be a viable card, right? Surely no one would ever put a Gem Knight monster into their deck just to summon this thing. Level 7 or lower Gem Knight fusion from Grave to copy its name and effect that turn. Each of these would find important slots in Gem Knight strategies in the future, with Lazuli and Master Diamond becoming backbones of a Gem Knight OTK with the release in 2014, and Seraphonite finding a completely unexpected home in 2015, which mm -hmm. we'll cover both when we get there. Laval would see a singular new relevant card, being Laval Wall Chain, <laughs> a rank 4 that can detach to Dude, all the Laval people in shambles when this card came out, because it was better for every other deck than it was for theirs. Bin a card from deck or stack a monster on top of the deck. 
Without exaggeration or hyperbole, this is to this day considered one of the strongest exceeds ever printed, yeah. as it would do so yeah. much for so many strategies simply by being a foolish burial Bro, on legs. I just realized it's not even just monsters, it's any card as well. This card is complete nuts. Revitalization of a certain strategy within the next few weeks. Gishki would be one of the strategies here that got a bit of the short end of the stick, but would receive one new boss monster, being Zeal Gigas, a level 10 <laughs> ritual that could pay a thousand Take life w, to draw Zeal cards and shuffle a card on field into deck if it was a Gishki monster. Zeal Gigas was yet another loop enabler for the deck, this time by being a draw tool that- Imagine uh, imagine all the other archetypes get like uh, Lavalval Chain, Daigusto Emerald, all that kind of stuff, and you get a Gishki Zeal Gigas. It happened to be level 10 meaning it gave the deck access to Kustoff Max, and stop me if you've heard this one before. Ironically though, this would not be the best card released for Gishki in this set, but we'll get there soon enough. Gusto would similarly receive a new Exceed tool, that being Digusto Emerald, a rank 4 that could detach to shuffle 3 monsters in Grave back into deck and draw 1, being effectively a mini Pot of Avarice on legs, seeing play for that reason initially, but in later formats being an mm. enabler for some of the most degenerate loops in the game's history. Constellar I mean, the, base, the only problem on this card is that they didn't put a hard ones per turn on it, because the... The loop potential is 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 crazy because you can like you can summon one, get it to the graveyard, summon another one, shuffle the first one back, and so on and so forth. Right, rinse, repeat. It's Reason a very simple but fa thing of like if you want this card to be used in a normal way, the way you designed it to be, right? Just freaking put a hard ones per turn on it. Matt's being an enabler for some of the most degenerate loops in the game's history. Constellar would be the first of the two new archetypes here, overtaking Vylon's light attribute slot, being a series of differently leveled light monsters aimed at using level modulation to access their various extra deck bosses. These included Algady, who specials a Constellar from hand on normal, Pollux, who gives you an extra normal for a Constellar the turn it's normal summoned, Kaos, who could level modulate a Constellar by one twice per turn, Pleiades, a light locked rank five that could detach to bounce a card on a quick effect once per turn, and Ptolemy M7, a rank six that could be overlaid onto Dude, a this Constellar. Gives me, exceed, uh, this gives me this gives me Duel Links flashbacks. When we casted the Duel Links Invitational, or uh, Duel Links uh, Challenger Cup two weeks ago, uh, I found out that Constellars have a complete custom skill in Duel Links that lets them exceed, ignoring all the levels. So like a level four Constellar and a level five Constellar now makes Constellar M7 in Duel Links. So if you're a huge Constellar fan, uh, they're actually uh, clapping up the meta in Duel Links right now because that skill is completely custom. And you can even, I think you can, you can even normal summon them without tribute. So like you can even summon the higher level ones with no problem. Like its other effect that turn if you do, and can detach one to bounce a monster from field or grave to hand once per turn. This strategy would, on release, see no play, as the primary issue it faced was consistency, as every monster that searched in archetype was not a level four, locking what plays you could do on the turn they're used. That isn't to say the deck would be locked in an unplayable camp forever, as some experimentation would be done with the deck regularly to attempt a Pleiades turbo strategy in addition to Ptolemy M7 entering the staple rank six pool immediately, helping many decks like Heratic, but also enabling loops with Gishki thanks to being makeable with Mind August <laughs> and Gus Kraken, which is part of the reason Gus Kraken was limited so far in advance. The other new archetype here was Evil Swarm, the dark replacement for Steel Swarms, although more notably could be considered an upgraded version due to most of the I forgot what this says. Eliminate, eradicate, exterminate. These are the thoughts of lingering steel swarm souls yearning for a body so that they might make their dream a reality. Okay. Their support specifying L swarm monsters meaning that they work with both Evil Swarm and Steel Swarm strategies, though were clearly built for this one. This initial wave included Heliotrope, a normal level 4 for rabbit shenanigans, O-Lantern, who could tribute itself to pop a face-up monster, Mandragora, who could special itself if your opponent controls more monsters, Castor, who gives an additional normal to turn its normaled, Thunderbird, who can banish itself when an effect is used and return itself Dude. in the next stand. Thunderbird is such a cool card that I I forgot exactly why that deck didn't pop off in the TCG, but there was a deck in the OCG that was called, I think they called it like Chain Beat or something like that, which I was so hyped for. I wanted to play it so badly, but then for some reason it didn't work anymore. So the, the entire concept of the deck was that you played, I think it played Evil Swarm Thunderbird and I think also Wind Up Rabbit, uh, because those two were basically impossible for your opponent to get rid of, right? Because uh, as soon as they try to, to, to do something to them, you just chain it and banish it for the next turn, right? And you play like Black Garden, because Black Garden makes it so all your opponent's monsters are halved, 
So when the Thunderbird and the Windup Rabbit come back, they ignore that because they're not summoned. They return, so they don't get halved. So they are incredibly big, and you can like, um, you can. I think it even it was called Chain Beat because you would always chain to all of their stuff. So you could even play cards like, um, I think they played like Accumulated Fortune and stuff like that. Because like your opponent goes activate a card, you go chain Thunderbird, chain Rabbit, um, chain Accumulated Fortune, draw two cards and stuff like that. It was such a cool control style deck, uh, at least in theory. And I never actually got to play it. I never actually got to play it. Is that a viable deck in any of the Time Wizard formats that people play? Like, and I, I'm asking, I don't know. Because I genuinely would be inclined to check out that... Time Wizard format for that. Right. Compulsory Escape Device was another card. Compulsory Escape Device is, I think, a compulsory evacuation device, but it banishes instead of back to hand or back to the deck instead of back to hand. I don't know. Where does Escape Device put the cards? Hand? Uh, shuffle into the deck. Shuff so Escape Device is a normal trap that says target one of your monsters, target one of your opponent's monsters, both go back into the deck but it didn't rely for the monsters to stay on the board. So if you had like an Evil Swarm Thunderbird, you go activate escape device, target your monster and my monster, banish Thunderbird, basically making the card free to use, uh, turning it into one of the best removal traps you would have at the current time. So it was a really cool deck. My face. They're Fairly certain Chain Beat is legal in Meadowlands. Uh, yeah, but I'm like, maybe, maybe, maybe the issue was more that it wasn't good because like Mono Mermail, maybe. Rank four's nightmare. Who can detach to flip a monster that gets special summoned? Yeah, summon maybe it's down. more like that. Comet, who can detach and discard an L swarm to steal an opponent's monster. Ophion, who locks level five and higher special summons while it has materials and can I detach to search an infestation spell trap. Or a Boros, a three map that can detach to activate one of its effects, but only once each while on the field. Being bouncing an opponent's card, hand ripping one, or banishing a card from the opponent's grave. Infestation pandemic, a quick play spell that links evil swarms. <laughs> immune Someone in chat said it's legal in Darkwing Blast format. You're not wrong. <laughs> you could play thunderbird wind up rabbit uh black garden and compulsory evac uh, thingy device in darkwing blast format you're not you're not wrong <laughs> Dispel traps that turn, and Infection, which trades an L Swarm in hand or on field for another <laughs> one in deck. There's probably one specific Exceed I mentioned there that stood out compared to the rest. And yes, Ophion Control became the name of the game for Evil Swarm strategies, matching up incredibly well into Mermail by locking them out of their level 7 Swarmers, but still being a bit of a bad matchup into the rest of the meta spread for now. YCS Lyle would be held the same weekend, and notably the new Hidden Arsenal set seemed to make zero impact on the scene, with Mermails continuing to dominate the meta, taking first place here piloted by Long Dao, incorporating the Gen X package back in. However, the set would see an who thinks? I, the way I lost in top eight of YCS Lil was the most heartbreaking ever because the situation was the following. I played a Mermail Mirror match in top eight against uh, Paolo Pacchiana, an Italian, um, who's also been relatively successful back in the day, I want to say. And it's game three. And I, I and I max C Paulo in his turn, and it's like uh, so two problems. Actually, this is a little bit of a longer story. So you know, blankies. This story starts in top sixteen. Funnily enough, this story starts in no, it starts in top thirty-two, actually. So top thirty-two, I play a mermail mirror match. Um. And my opponent uses Big Eye onto Dweller uh, and forgets to give it back, right? And I don't notice it. Like, I win, but my opponent has the Dweller, and we both don't notice it. And I, I go on to play top 16, right? I go on to play top 16, and it's like... Um, we start playing... We start playing... And I believe, I don't know exactly which game I notice it. I think it, it's probably game one. I know, I know that in one of the games, I go first. I think it's game one. I go first and I go to make a rank four. I look into my extra deck and I want to make Dweller. Um, and it's not there, right? It's not there. And so I'm like, <laughs> basically, 
I I raise my hand. I call for a judge because you know obviously I can just make Bahamut Shark and act like it's not it's nothing. But like I I I, I raise my hand. I call for a judge. I'm like, hey, my my dweller is missing. You know, my my dweller is missing. Uh, what do we do about it, right? Uh, and the judges go and decide whatever they they talk for. I think solid twenty minutes or something like that. Uh, what, what they can do about it, and they decide to uh they decide that. Since I I was honest and didn't just do the Bahamut shark and and you know I I did it by myself. They're like, uh, actually no, I remember I lost game one and I went first in game two. That's why this is important. They were like, because you you were so honest and said it by yourself, we're not gonna give you a game loss because you would lose the match instantly, right? Uh, instead, you're you're gonna get like you're gonna have to play the rest of the tournament without your dweller, but you can keep playing, right? Which my opponent was mad about, but they decided it that way, whatever. Because uh, they were like, you know, we're not going to punish you for being honest in this situation, wh whatever, right? And, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm playing a mermail mirror without Dweller. I probably lose anyways, uh, but whatever, right? And I, 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 I win game two and game three somehow without Dweller in the mermail mirror match, right? Uh, and <laughs> my opponent's a little pissed about it. My opponent's a little pissed about it, but I mean, they they lost two out of three games without Dweller, so I guess you know it's, it's whatever. And uh, and I move on to top eight, and this this time in game three against Paulo, I can't make Dweller right because they said you can't you can't add the Dweller back, which I don't know why they did that. Like technically, you know, my decklist had Dweller on it, so they could have given me the Dweller back, but I guess they wanted to they wanted there to be some kind of punishment for it. I don't know exactly what ha what happened. I was just happy because honestly, when I raised my hand and called for a judge, I thought I was done for anyways. I thought I was gonna get a game loss and that's it, right? But like it was the right thing to do, so I did it. So I was just happy that I didn't get a game loss and even that I managed to win top sixteen after, right? But then game three of top eight, I, I don't have a dweller and I'm sitting there in the mermail mirror match going first, right? And I can't make dweller. I make Bahamut Shark. Um, actually, no, it's not it's not going first because my opponent already had a set card. I think it was going second. My opponent set a card. I played into it. Uh, uh, like my opponent made a board, set one card. I played into it. I end on a Bahamut Shark with a max C in hand, right? And my opponent starts their turn with one set card and a couple cards in their hand. I don't know exactly how many. And they start playing, I maxi them, and they just keep playing. They just keep playing and summoning and summoning and summoning. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I already have Tragodia in my hand, which at the time you played cards to accompany your maxi in case your opponent went to a... Uh, in case your opponent went to a, like, accept the maxi challenge, basically. You, paid, you played cards like Tragodia and Gores. Um, I don't remember if I played both or if I just played Tragodia, but I definitely, I know I had a Tragodia. And so my opponent goes through the motions for an OTK and gives me like 15 cards or something, right? And I'm like, okay, I win. I have track, nothing they can do, no more cards in hand. I just Omega kill them next turn, right? We move on to top four, which at the time I think would have been my first top four at a YCS. So I'm like, okay, chill, right? And so, uh... They, 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 they put the damage onto the board, right? They go to the battle phase. I have 20 cards in hand. And what they do is they flip Mind Crush and they call Tragodia. And I'm like, oh my god, dude. First of all, what if I have Gorse instead of Tragodia? What if I have Gorse instead of Tragodia? Like, god damn it, man. And I just, I have to discard my Tragodia for the, for the Mind Crush. And they attack me for game, and I lose in a situation where I'm like, "That this game is over. This game is over, over." I think I even had two Tragodias um, in the deck, which is maybe why they called Mind Crush uh, with Mind Crush. But I think because I had both Tragodias in my hand, I think even if they have a debunk, I win, right? Because debunk was a very popular card at the time, if it was out yet. I think I think it was out. Um, so debunk wasn't a concern for me because I had um, I had two Tragodias. Also, if if they had debunked, they would have probably debunked Maxi. Uh, so I'm like, that's not a thing. And then the mind crush comes in and like literally crushes my soul. Um, and that's how I lost top eight of YCS Lil. Very very frustrating, but it happens.
Uh, taking first place here piloted by Long Dao, incorporating the Gen X package back in. However, the set would see an impact on YCS Meadowlands two weeks later on May 12th, and this particular event is regularly revisited in Retroplay due to its shocking diversity following Hidden Arsenal 7's release. With a couple of new decks popping up from these pieces, the first, and most obvious, was Evil Swarm, sporting a Rescue Rabbit package here to access Ophion quickly and reliably, sporting a whole suite of back row to play Defend the Castle once summoned including one of the first big appearances of Safe Zone in the metagame, a choice that would grow more popular later in the year with the release of another Exceed to help Evil Swarm's game plan. The other big shakeup was the first appearance of Exceed Infernity, using Rank 4 Swarming enablers like Summoner Monk and Stygian Street Patrol to get you to evolve all chain quickly. Okay, debunk was out, it's right there. Did you get your Dweller back? No, no, I didn't, I didn't get my Dweller back. My Dweller was gone, and it was like 20 bucks at the time. <laughs> it was like 20 bucks at the time. My Dweller was gone, gone who in turn set up your grave for your singular copy of Launcher to do as much work as it possibly could, or to stack Archfiend on top of the deck for its own summon effect to trigger. Tyree Tinsley would take the event on Mermail, once again showing the consistent power of the meta threat, back to cutting the Gen X package out. Unfortunately to many players, Meadowlands format is also known as the end of early Zexal, as many decks that were viable here, the great diversity that had been cultivated, and the vibe that almost any strategy could compete, was about to be completely shattered, as the player base braced itself for what we've known was coming for months. We were about to enter the Dragon's Den. Lord of the Tachyon. It's a little bit less impact, like uh, impressive when I think back to when we played Dragon Rulers in Master Duel like two weeks ago. So the feelings I'm feeling right now are not as strong because of that. <laughs> There's the that it's it puts a little bit of a damper on my on my emotions right now that uh, we played these guys like two weeks ago and they all completely sucked in in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> Galaxy. Release date, May 17th, 2013. <laughs> oh, it was such a Corset. cool deck, though, Major at the time. Dragon Ruler, Spellbook, Mecha Phantom Beast. Impact, the meta capsizes. Let's be completely fair on this one. Anyone who knows any bit of the history of this game knows that this particular set would be the... This is um 2013's Age of Overlord, by the way, everyone. Like, this is the one where everyone went on to complain about card prices, because Draco Sack was a secret rare, and that thing was, like, over... I, th I want to say over 100... Uh, but yeah, it was very expensive. And then there was Spellbook of Judgment for, for Spellbooks. Ironically, for Dragon Rulers, the main deck was almost nothing, because all the Dragon Rulers were rares. Uh, which I can't even imagine what would have happened if, uh... I can't even imagine what would have happened if the Dragon Rulers were, like, secrets. God damn first of a couple major turning points in the game's history. Starting here and moving into the next year of releases, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a game which shift from the core concepts of the early years into what we really know now as the modern version of the game, and it all started with the release of the Dragon Rulers. The Dragon Rulers are a series of level 7 dragons, one of each elemental attribute, being Redox for Earth, Tidal for Water, Blaster for Fire, and Tempest for Wind. Chat, what's your favorite Dragon Ruler? What's your favorite Dragon Ruler? I'll tell you which one's mine, but I don't want to influence your decision. Dude, so many are saying Tidal. I think Tidal might be because Mermail played Tidal later. That's fair enough. Tidal's pretty cool. My favorite is Blaster. Each sharing the same three abilities. Able to summon themselves from hand or grave by banishing two monsters that are either dragons or their attribute from hand or grave. Able to search a dragon of their attribute when banished. And each having a unique ability that activates by discarding themselves with another monster of their attribute. With Redox reviving a monster, Tidal dumping a monster from deck, Blaster popping a card on field, and Tempest searching for any dragon. With each only being able to use one of these effects a turn. In addition, they each had a baby counterpart that could be discarded alongside any monster that's either a dragon or shares its attribute to summon its corresponding dragon ruler from deck. These cards would completely upend the established metagame taking over and dominating the game for the remainder of the year, and with many considering the impending format of Dragon Ruler format to be one of the most skill-intensive formats of all time, which we'll go more in-depth on with the next- That's the thing, right? Like, these cards were undoubtedly completely broken at the time, right? And I do understand the criticism for how they completely turned and changed the viability of, of all the decks in the metagame, like, because as soon as this came out, like, everything previously was basically forgotten, right? Uh, which I, I do understand that criticism, but the, the format it, in itself was still very, very good when it comes to just the pure level of gameplay. Um, like, there's multiple aspects to what makes a good for, a format good or bad. You know, accessibility of the decks is, is one of the things for sure. But if you just look at 
how good was the gameplay how much how much more likely was a better player to win against the worst player dragon ruler even the mirror match was pretty damn good like the the dragon ruler mirror match was very very skill intensive at the time um it was it was pretty cool actually it's major tournament in the meantime, though, an extremely notable point for the deck here was that the Dragon Ruler cards themselves... Emptiness, though, max emptiness was a problem, but people haven't figured out it that... Uh, people didn't figure it out yet until, I think, Patrick Hoban. So it was a while... Well, like, uh, I think for the majority of Dragon Ruler format, at least the early Dragon Ruler days, people didn't play that card that much. ...out at the rare rarity slot, making the entire archetype shockingly cheap for the time. However, because of this, the entire value of the deck, in turn, quickly pumped into the rank 7 extra deck pool, with yeah. the previously released Big Eye spiking immediately on reveal that these would be low rarity. A similar fate would befall the Mecha Phantom Beast cards released here. <laughs> Dark type of monsters focus around... Dude, the imagine you were a Mecha Phantom Beast main looking forward to Draco Sack re re release, and then there's just this dragon deck, which completely obliterates your wallet because... Draco Sack is like over a hundred bucks because of it. <laughs> Summoning and utilizing their archetypal tokens, with Tether Wolf being a level four that summons a token and adds the level of all tokens onto itself, making itself a level seven on summon, and their rank seven exceed Draco Sack, who can detach a material to summon two tokens and contribute Mecha Phantom Beast cards to pop a card on field once per turn. Unable to be destroyed by battle or card effect while you control a token, Draco Sack would instantly hit the hundred dollar plus club, being one of the best extra deck monsters to summon using the Dragon Rulers, who also formed an interesting dynamic with Big Eye specifically, forming a mind game between players in the mirror match, while Tether Wolf would be a normal summon tech for some builds, able to access Draco Sack with a token already on field for protection. It's, it's, I mean, it's worth noting that Draco Sack is still playable to this day, right? Like we've just seen it uh, last week, I want to say, in some cash tier lists, right? It's like it's not the greatest card ever anymore, but it's it's still a pretty good card considering Link summons with tokens. Like it's a it's a it's a viable Yu-Gi-Oh card. Would receive Leopard, a level 3 200 defense monster that contributed itself to set a fire formation from deck, notable for both being summonable. Yeah, with the big, guy, and big Guy was like really cheap beforehand because no one used it except for Mermails using one copy. Right? Mermails used one Big Guy, but that didn't make it go super expensive. Like it was, I th I'm pretty sure it was more than 10 bucks because it was a secret rare and Mermail played it. But it wasn't ex as expensive as it turned out to be after these card guys released. And Spirit, beginning the waves of support for the theorized three-axis deck. And Big Eye is also still good. would be the next major DM-era archetype to receive the legacy support treatment, seeing Channeler, who could discard a Harpy card to summon another Harpy from deck, becoming a level 7 if you controlled a dragon, and Hysteric Sign, which searched Elegant Egotist on activation and searched her up to three different Harpies in the end phase of the turn it's put in grave. Both of these would be insanely strong pieces to make Harpy a viable rank 4 and 7 strategy, especially with the previously released Lightning Chidori. But unfortunately, was competing with the strongest rank 7 strategy ever in the same set, as well as the already meta one. Speaking of, Mermail would receive Abyss Osha, able to trade a Mermail on field for any number in deck whose total level equals that monster's. Osha is a good card that ended up being relevant after Dragon Rulers. Uh, when, when they went back, well, people... It's funny, because Mermail was such a good and powerful deck for the time. Uh, it was just that Dragon Rulers release immediately stopped Mermail from being uh, relevant. But then when Dragon Rulers left, Mermail came back. An abyss scale of the Mizuchi, and then providing Oshia spell was negation on resolution of activation, both being powerful tools for Mermail to adapt with. Madolche would receive Hootcake, a level 3 beast that could special summon a Madolche from deck by banishing a monster in Grave, specifically useful for summoning Messengelato from deck to trigger its search effect with a Madolche. Dude, fun fact, Eugen, at the time, thought Madolche was a good deck. Looking at Spellbook and Dragon Rulers, do with that information what you will. But Eugen liked Medolce. Medolce Beast already being on board. King of the Feral Limps is a rank 4 that searches for any reptile monster, becoming a staple part of various extra decks over the next few years by being able to grab a random reptile extender for strategies. Sacred Sword of 7 Stars can banish a level 7 in hand to draw 2, being a draw tool that felt almost tailor-made for dragon rulers to use and abuse. Girgia Gear is a trap that could summon two Girgiano monsters from deck, I hate boosting Gear their Gear. levels by 1, giving you instant access to the rank 4 exceed pool while also increasing the playability of the previously overlooked level 3 Girgias. Mind Drain was the third of the Drain Continuous Traps, able to prevent effects in hand from activating, locking hand traps and some summon effects. Totem <laughs> the fact that you just said it was the third of the Drain cards made me think of the it fact that they thought it was a good three. idea to make uh, to make the Skill Drain card into an archetype, which is, it's, ah! No, what did I do? Uh-oh. Okay, perfect. Saved. Some summon effects. Totem Bird was a TCG exclusive wind locked rank 3, able to negate a spell trap by detaching 2, seeing some play in later rank 3 wind strategies. 
Noble Arms of Destiny is yet another solid Noble Arms spell, giving its monster protection from destruction once per turn, slotting into the Noble Knight strategy instantly. Constellar and Evil Swarm would see their OCG imports here in Sombre and Kerkeon, who have the same cards. effect just for their respective archetypes, able to banish an archetypal monster engraved to add another to hand, then providing an additional normal summon that turn for their archetype. Of the two, Kirikion would see the immediate success thanks to Evil Swarm already being a popular option in the meta, giving another tool to turbo into Ophion. Though Constellar would also receive Omega, a light locked rank 4 that can detach to make Constellars immune to spells and traps that turn, becoming a solid rank 4 option for light decks in general. Lastly, and by far the most important card outside of the Dragon Rulers themselves, Spellbook of Judgment could, no. at the end of the turn you activate it, search for different spellbooks for each spell you activated after its resolution, and summon a spellcaster monster whose level is equal to or lower than the number you added. This was one of the biggest resource pressing <laughs> cards. I mean, look, hey, the dragon rulers were really, really broken, but the, des the design behind the dragon rulers, I kind of understand, right? The process behind it. The design process behind Spellbook of Judgment is a mystery to me because who the hell sat down and made this card? Like, unironically, at the time, like, dragon rulers, you're like, okay, let's come up with this really grindy and cool, uh, a dragon archetype that can search each other and like whatever you know make rank sevens and then there's other, and one other guy in the corner like also what if we make a single card for spellbook that goes plus seven and they're like oh okay okay <laughs> well, that's that's cool let's do that too let's do that too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's do that as well <laughs> ever printed, able to reliably reach three plus spellbooks off of its activation, and summon a powerful spellcaster afterward, commonly <laughs> reaching either Jalgen to lock special summons or Kaiku to lock banishing from the grave against dragon rulers. This one card would push spellbooks from their previously tier three level status through the go-to deck that wasn't Was this a dragon TCG Ruler. exclusive? I forgot if they said that. Was this a TCG exclusive or did the, the OCG also had it, no? I don't think it was a TCG exclusive, yeah, okay which we'll discuss more about soon enough. Following Tachyon, there would be a couple of much smaller releases, starting with Superstarter V for Victory almost a month later, being the year start- This was not, uh, this is actually false advertising, because this does not give you victory. Starter deck and containing no new cards worth talking about. The second would be the second battle pack, War of the Giants, two weeks after the starter decks which was mostly notable for shifting what set was played for sealed events moving forward, but also for having a couple of interesting reprints, such as Card Card D, Mermail Abyss Megalo, Pot of Duality, and Breakthrough Skill. The WC circuit for the year would be shortly after this release, starting with the European WC... Dude, this was the, this was the European Championship? Uh, this tournament alone, unironically, if this tournament never happens, we might still have the old time rules. Um, I'll, I'll say it, I'll say it up front. If this tournament doesn't happen... In the history of Yu-Gi-Oh, like in the timeline that we're in, we might still have the old time rules. Because this, the day one of this European Championship went on to, I'm trying not to, to give you the wrong time, but 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning? I don't know exactly how long it went on. But it was after midnight for day one of this tournament. Because... The Dragon Ruler Mirror Matches, Dr Dragon Ruler Mirror Matches, with three extra turns, curtains, curtains. Also, uh, Michel Grüner still still played, so it was it was it was it was, it was Jover. Two a.m. I think one a.m. or two a.m. It was it was yeah. UCQ on June 29th, and although we do not have a full picture of the top cut like we would like, there was a clear winner for the new top deck of the format. Dragon Ruler had taken over, with most builds already centralizing around a few specific cards. The first point was the ratios of the rulers to babies was already fairly set, seeing three of each ruler and two of each baby across multiple lists. The second was Frankfurt the Heroes with Gishki One Day of Peace FTK. I don't remember that story. I don't know what that is about was the inclusion of Super Rejuvenation at its maximum three copies commonly, as by discarding with the baby effects, you would receive two draws at the end of the turn with Rejuvenation, or four if you used two baby effects that turn, which in turn could get you to another Rejuvenation, which as a quick play spell could be activated in the end phase after drawing it to draw even more. The third was Gold Sarcophagus, which was being played at two to three copies, able to banish a ruler from the deck to trigger its search effect for a baby, which in turn got you to the main ruler regardless, and the inclusion of level one tuners like Effect Dealer and Dragoonity Corsesca to access the level eight Synchro Pool, specifically Crimson Blader, who locked up the mirror match itself quite effectively. Fourth, and probably most telling for the future of the game, was a specific card that found its way into a few side decks here, being Vanity's Emptiness. 
The trap from Shining Darkness was finally being recognized for the power it represented, allowing you to set up your board with the rulers, then flip this on your opponent's turn to block them from doing the same. This was extra effective in the mirror match at this point, as few players played back row removal in the deck outside of the singular heavy storm, meaning to out it, commonly one would need Blaster and another Fire to do the job. I mean... Darkhold also outs it, depending on what board they make. If it's just Draco Sacks, then Darkhold doesn't. But yeah. However, very notably, Dragon Ruler would not take the event overall, with that honor going to Chris Bodolaudis on Spellbook, playing yeah. a large suite of 26 spells to chain activations after Judgment to activate the various tools to counter Dragon Ruler's dominance in the format, with both Jalgen and Kaiku locking different aspects of the deck. Jalgen specifically would be a really interesting piece here, as its 1300 defense body actually proved to be rather difficult to out for Dragon Rulers, as the only normal summon in the deck that could do it natively was Stream, being 1600 attack. Meaning that outside of that, the only reliable card to out it was similarly the Blaster Pop. Evil Swarm would also perform quite well here for two major reasons. The first, and most obvious, was Ophion locking the Dragon Ruler summons in addition to the summon of High Priestess from the Spellbook matchup, only being outable by a few specific cards thanks to Infestation Pandemic providing protection, which was searchable by Ophion. The second, and less obvious to the naked eye, was the price point. With the entire deck being effectively found That's in Hidden Arsenal yeah. 7, the deck was shockingly affordable compared to its competitors, which led to the deck's performance being boosted, even though it was clearly the weakest of the three. The South American WCQ would take place the same weekend, and a lot of the like, points we just discussed would I don't like Evil Swarm because its main purpose was floodgating Dragon Rulers, but for a budget option at the time, it w actually wasn't bad. Like, it was a scary deck to go up against with Dragon Rulers, especially, obviously, if they went first. Uh, and, like, honestly, you can't really argue with the fact that both Dragon Ruler and Spellbook were incredibly expensive, so it was completely reasonable to go for a different deck if you felt like it. And it was probably the best, the third best option and cheapest option was probably Evil Swarm. So it's, it's fair enough. Would be present here too, with rulers taking 15 top spots, followed by Spellbooks at 8 and Evil Swarm at 7, though notably all 7 Evil Swarm would be eliminated moving into top 16. Carlos Perez would take the event on Dragon Rulers, playing a similar build to what we saw in Europe, but notably including two copies of Breakthrough Skill as a way to out Ophion's lock with the two vanities in the side for locking out the mirror match. The Central American WCQ would be a week later, and at this stage, Dragon Rulers and Spellbooks had narrowed the field around them to a knockout dragout war between the two titans, with Alejandro Suarez taking the event on Rulers, who did not make his list public. While there was one more WCQ event with coverage we can go through, there would be one more set release prior to it occurring, and though it wouldn't bring too much new to the table, it would be important to cover it for one card that would change the dynamic of Dragon Rulers heavily. Number Hunters. Release date, July 11th, 2013. Set Wait, type, which card are we, are we talking about? Master Blades or what? Set. Major Strategies, Various OCG Exclusive Exceeds. Impact, a couple of interesting exceeds for the pool. Number Hunters was probably one of the most out-of-nowhere sets for us to receive, right up there with Star Pack just a little bit earlier this year. In reality, this set was an import set to catch us up with some of the OCG's Exclusive Exceeds monsters up to this point, most of which were incredibly niche, but held their uses, such as number 49 Fortune Tune as a Time Win Con, number 85 Crazy Box as a Drain Beat Boss. I mean, Master of Blades was a good card, but I think it was almost entirely... Um... Like, it was, it was too small, I think. Metquip the Engineer is a stall option, Coach King Giant Trainer is a draw tool for rank 8 strategies, and, most importantly for our context, number 74, Master yeah. of Blades. Like, this thing is not good in the Dragon Ruler Mirror match because it gets run over by Crimson Blader. Like, that card, there was a lot of scenarios, like, I think, I, I don't even know if we, like, we played it as an option, but it didn't really come up much. This card needed to be like 100 or 200 points bigger and then it was good, would have been good in Dragon Rulers, but it, it was too small. A rank 7 that can negate and destroy a card that targets it, popping another card on field when it does. This would solve a major issue with the Dragon Ruler Mirror match, that being what threat to make going first. For most matchups, going first you'd want to make Draco Sack to set up a wall protected by its tokens, but in the Mirror match, this could be completely upended by the summon of an opposing big eye. You're never going to make this in the Mirror match going first. Like, I'm sorry, that's just not what happened. That's not what people did. You don't summon this in the mirror. If you summon this in the mirror match going first, you lose immediately. Because they make a Crimson Blader and attack it. And you lost the game on the spot. Stealing the Draco Sack and making the situation far worse. Master of Blades solves that issue, giving the deck a turn one option that didn't lose to Big Eye, which we'd see soon enough. The North American WCQ nah. would be held the same weekend, and, shockingly, we'd see Dragon Ruler continue to dominate the space, taking first place piloted by Patrick Hoven, notably main decking two- Without Master of Blades, because you wouldn't make that ever. Copies of Vanity's Emptiness, <laughs> you, you, for the you didn't the play it, like genuinely you didn't. it was reasonably didn't. going to be the most common matchup. This would end the WCQ circuit for the year and lead into the next- Because the whole- the whole big eye exchange is not bad for you. Because if they big eye your Draco sack, you will be able to attack their big eye with the Crimson Blader. The the Dragon Ruler mirror match was so centered around um around Crimson Blader, like it was it was unreal because 
it wasn't possible to consistently OTK this deck, right? Because people would... Um, uh, Swift Scare Scarecrow was very popular and stuff like that, right? And so, like, Crimson Blader was the one way how you could try to maybe you would try to kill the opponent and if it didn't work they could still not play the next turn right and so it was it was so centered around crimson blader that you would even play cards like uh burai right the way you use burai because there's no karakuris in the deck you don't summon anything off of it if you um like if your opponent passes on a, a redox which was very common if you had maxi they would stop after redox um that was a whole nother thing like if you could you would try to start by you wanted to start by special summoning Blaster or Redox, or using Burner or um, Reactan as your first special summon always, because if you didn't do that and you got Max Seed, you had to pass on a Dragon Ruler that was smaller than Crimson Blader. And that was, you immediately lost the game to Max Seed. If you start with um, Stream or Lightning or Tidal Effect or Tempest Effect and they have Max Seed, it's Curtains, it's Jover. You get, you get Crimson Blader, it's, it's done. Uh, so that's why you wanted to start with Redox or Blaster in the first place, right? And so, like, that's how much it rolled around Crimson Blader. Uh, and then on the Redox thing, if you passed on Redox or Blaster, uh, you could use Bure to turn that into defense uh, and, and then make Crimson Blader to attack over it, right? That, that whole sequence needed two tuners, which meant that you needed to assemble... You needed Redox to revive the tuner because you couldn't get a tuner other than normal summoning. So the, the, it was a combo that needed a decent amount of cards, but it was the reason you played Burai, right? You, you, you summon Burai, you turn their thing to attack, um, and then you revive the tuner with uh, Redox, and then you make Crimson Dragon to attack over Redox in attack or Blaster in defense. That's how much it revolved around Crimson Blader. So at that time, you would never ma make Master of Blades. Like, that card legitimately just didn't have an application in, in how the mirror match was being approached piloted by Patrick Hoven, notably main decking two copies of Vanity's Emptiness, prepping for the mirror in the main deck, as it was reasonably going to be the most common matchup. This would end the WCQ circuit for the year and lead into the next course. I think if anything, the most impactful card in Number Hunters was probably Crazy Box because it was a generic eradicator target in the long run. Uh, and, and for some rogue decks in this format, if you wanted to beat Spellbooks, what you would do is just play Eradicator with Rank Force, right? That Like Fire Fist, for example, uh, that they picked up a way to beat... Um, to beat Spellbook with Crazy Box into Eradicator. Prior to the World Championships in a month. And any hope of seeing a meta not dominated by Dragon Rulers would entirely rest on this new set. Ha! <laughs> Bujin. Bujin to beat Dragon Rulers, Keck W. Judgment Ooh, Star Eater is cool. Release date, August 9th, 2013. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Bujin, Trap Tricks, Fire Fist. Impact, setting up the meta half a year away. Judgment of the Light is an odd set looking back on it in retrospect, not because it was bad, not by a long shot, but because even though a number of strategies released here would be meta, they were completely overshadowed on yeah. release due to the dragons raging in the back. It was impossible to make, like, they, they had two options. Either we make more support for Dragon Ruler or Spellbook, which would be completely outrageous, or we make new cards that will be viable after Dragon Rulers and Spellbooks are gone, which is what they decided to do. But nothing, nothing here had insane impact into the Dragon Ruler format, but a lot of it was good after Dragon Ruler. Ground. The first of the new strategies of note was Bujin, a series of Beast Warrior Bujins and Beast and Winged Beast Bujinjis, with the Bujinjis providing some benefit to a Beast Warrior Bujin on the board by either discarding themselves or banishing themselves from grave. This initial wave included Yamato, who could add a Bujin from deck to hand in the end phase, discarding a Bujin if you did, Quillen, able to be banished from grave while you control a Beast Warrior Bujin to pop a face-up card, Turtle, able to banish itself from grave to negate a card that targets a Bujin, Crane, able to discard itself to double a Beast Warrior Bujin's attack in the damage step, Susanoo, a Bujin locked rank 4 that can attack all monsters once each and can detach to either search or dump a Bujin, and Bujin Carnation, which summons a Bujin from grave and the banished zone while you control no monsters but the opponent does. Bujin was one of the strongest examples ever of a helmet deck, basically aiming to stick Yamato and throw all protection onto it, being a simple concept of get the helmet and put on the damn helmet. An incredibly basic strategy, but had bones, needing a couple more worthwhile main deck Beast Warrior Bujins to be worth it. The other new archetype here was Trap Tricks, a series of earth insects and plants that interact with the normal trap hole cards, like the classic trap hole and the meta staple bottom line. I feel like there's a difference with how they've initially done the Trap Tricks artworks and with how they do them now. I can't quite put my finger on what that difference is, though, to be fair. I kind of like the... I kind of like the old ones more, though. Trap Hole. All being immune to whole normal traps. 
This first wave included Mermello, who searched a whole normal trap on normal summon and pops a spell trap on special summon, Nepenthes, who searches or summons a trap tricks from the deck if you activate a whole normal trap, and Trap Tricks Trap Hole Nightmare, a trap that negates and destroys a special summoned monster that activates an effect the turn it's summoned. This archetype did hold potential out the gate thanks to Mermello searching the ever popular bottom list on normal summon, but would clearly need more support to do anything impactful in the metagame. Fire Fist would receive its most pivotal wave of support yet, oh, Rooster. being Rooster, okay. an OCG import that, if special summoned by a Fire Fist effect, searches a Fire Fist monster, able to send a fire formation to grave to set another from deck. This would be the piece that finally brought the three axis version of the deck together, able to search a copy of Spirit on Revive from a copy of Spirit or an initial summon from Horse Sprints, cycle a fire formation, then either make a rank three or a level six synchro, giving the strategy the follow-up potential it needed so badly. Unfortunately, the support would be too late for the deck to do anything relevant due to the environment around it and the next fan list, which would take effect prior to the first YCS it could potentially do anything at. Moving into other cards in the set, Galaxy Surfeit was a normal level 2 dragon tuner, useful for some heretic and dragon strategies for hitting certain levels in the extra deck. Maskamillion revives a zero defense monster on summon, providing synchro and exceed access for specific strategies that happen to be searchable by King of the Feral Limps, which would come up in later formats. Flying C was the next C hand trap, able to summon itself to the <laughs> opponent's board and lock exceed. BA enjoyers and shambles, dude. BA enjoyers in shambles summons, seeing some experimentation. Armadie's Keeper of Boundaries was the newest Synchro 5 staple, able to stun effects while attacking, seeing play in any deck that could make him. Star Eater was Dude, a level- Armadie's looks so badass. What the hell? If you look up close to it, that's a sick artwork. 11 Synchro Star Eater too, by the way. be stopped or responded to and became immune to card effects while attacking, becoming an option for the Dragon Ruler extra deck using level 4 tuners, like the Bree Dragon. Number 66, Master Key Beetle, was a dark locked rank 4 that could detach to select a card on- Okay, I don't like Key Beetle. <laughs> Key Beetle emptiness was, um, annoying, to say the least. Field, protecting that card from destruction while on the field and able to pop a protected card to protect itself, seeing play in Evil Swarm decks thanks to its ability to become an invincible threat by hitting Safe Zone onto itself, or to permanently lock special summons by targeting Vanity's Emptiness. Herald of Pure Light is a rank 2 that can add a card in Grave back to hand, then shuffle a card in hand back into deck, being a decent recursion option for rank 2 decks. Transmodify was probably one of the most interesting pieces to experiment with from this set, able to send a monster to Grave to summon a monster of the same People type and attribute one level higher from deck seeing experimentation with multiple strategies from agents to dark world. Was this already, was was Archfiend limited at this time? I forgot what the state is. I know we have one launcher, but is Archfiend limited? Or is it at three? Not yet, okay. But finding a home in Infernity of all things, due to being able to change a spent Necromancer into an Archfiend. Cockadoodle yeah. Do was a TCG exclusive that could be a level 3, 4, or 5 based on how you summon it, being an interesting tuner for some decks to play with. Noble Knight Driston would be the first solid target to summon with Madrot, able to pop a face-up card on field when equipped with a Noble Arm spell, which would naturally happen through Madrot's effect popping its equip on summon. Coach Soldier Wolfbark was an OCG import that could revive a level 4 Fire Beast Warrior in Grave, being a rank 4 enabler specifically for Fire Fist and Fire King decks. Speaking of, Fire King Avatar Yaksha was an OCG import that could destroy a monster on field or in hand on destruction, being a solid enabler for Fire King that the deck was desperately missing. Lastly, Fencing Fire Ferret can, upon being destroyed, oh, I love face Fencing up Fire Ferret. Burning the I played Fencing Fire Ferret so much at that time. Opponent, being an option for countering out specific meta threats. The 2013 Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship would be held the same weekend, and unsurprisingly, with all of the pieces of the deck available in both regions. I swear to God, if you don't, if you didn't use the the fist bump, uh picture for for the world champion that year yes. that'd be a missed Dragon opportunity Ruler absolutely dominated this tournament taking six of the top eight leaving only two spots for spellbooks huang xian of taiwan no, did you didn't the use it the aforementioned dragon rulers claiming the title of world champion for 2013 but there was one specific inclusion in his build that would be noted for all future the eclipse wyvern uh, light and darkness dragon was pretty uh pretty sick iterations of the deck that being dragon ravine the Dragoonity Field spell. Ravine had one major purpose here, help load Dragon Rulers into the graveyard, as by discarding a card once per turn, you could effectively gain a repeatable Foolish Burial for the deck, which would continue to see play long after this event. It also had the side benefit of searching Corsesca if you need- It was... I would argue, I don't know ex his exact reasoning, but as someone who played at the time and almost exclusively played Dragon Rulers, I think his main reasoning for the Ravine was not to get access to the dragon rulers because this deck didn't have that problem the deck usually had all the rulers anyways but the, the the main reason why dragon ravine was good was because it set up the eclipse wyvern into light and darkness dragon otk line that was safe from swift scarecrow that was the main purpose because swift scarecrow was like a big deal in this mirror match this mirror match was very decided by swift scarecrow like for example if you manage to like i said earlier a lot of it was about um being able to Crimson Blader your opponent. One way how you could um, afford to get Crimson Bladered 
is if you get Crimson Blader, next turn you just don't do anything, and you just Swift Scarecrow them next turn, right? Like, you just live the next attack, and then it's like as if Crimson Blader didn't happen, right? Um, because, yeah, your opponent can summon some more monsters, but it's like, uh, at this point, like, as, as if they already have the board and you don't have anything that they can pop with their Draco Sacks, they have limited stuff that they can do, right? And because they have a Crimson Blader on the board, as soon as you get to play, you can do that really cool play where you go Colossal Fighter, double, uh, double with your opponent's Crimson Blader, and then Colossal Fighter brings back their Crimson, uh, their Crimson Blader. Dude, Colossal Fighter, best card ever made. Um, so, like, as, as long as you were able to skip one turn with swift scarecrow uh it was it wasn't that bad if you got crimson bladed which was the main reason why everyone played cards like swift scarecrow battle fader whatever right um for for the world champion it was only in the side deck but it's there so dragon ravine being able to function as both a pseudo starter card like it's not better to draw dragon ravine than to draw a baby dragon directly for example but it's like it's it works it's a fine starter card but it also has the option it can give you a tuner in corseska but mainly it can access the eclipse wyvern light and darkness dragon line i think that was the genius behind this deck list and i think that's what won him the world championship the fact that there was a that he found a solution to this whole swift scarecrow game that people played because there was this, people took this this uh trying to stop your opponent's battle phase so far there was a guy in top four at worlds i think i'm pretty sure it was top four um who played try for tessops or whatever that thing is called which is not even a good card but they that was how far people went to 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 interact with the opponent in the battle phase that's how far people went What's Sukuyomi for? So Sukuyomi is one of the uh, one of the cards that people used to out uh, Jaugen from uh, from Spellbooks, and because Spellbooks and Dragon Rulers were two very very grindy decks, the fact that Sukuyomi would return to your hand and you would basically have an out to the Jaugen for the rest of the game was pretty relevant, right? Like it was like even if they had Spellbook of Fate, uh, they would have to probably banish your Sukuyomi immediately, and you were f free for the rest of the turn. Um, but yeah, show the card. Uh, try for Tessops? I don't even know how you write that thing. Try for Tessops. Try for Tressops is what it's called. Hold up. Try for... Tressops. Uh... During either player's turn, if your opponent summoned three or more monsters this turn, you can special summon this card from your hand. If, if summoned this way, it's unaffected by other card effects, but loses 500 defense during e each player's standby phase. It's genuinely not a good card. But it was just, it was 2800, which is enough defense to just sit there against stuff like Crimson Blader. And if your opponent goes for an OTK, you can summon this thing and, 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 and sit, on, sit on it. That's it. And, and they, they made top four at worlds with this thing needed a level one tuner following the world's performance of dragon ruler the 2013 collector's tens would begin dropping reprinting blaster and title in a much higher secret rarity alongside super rare reprints of karakuri bore gagaga cowboy firefist bear bls Cataster, and gustav max with the latter being notable for oh this was the time where the tins came with a bunch of like a pack of super rares right is that what it's what how this the worked EU region for the first time however the far more culturally significant impact in fact the arguably most significant impact of all of 2013 on the game would take place shortly after on september 1st being on the surface another ban list update but this one was far different than any that came before it up until this point, the TCG ban list oh. was a direct one-to-one -one copy of the OCG's ban right. list, which, notably, meant that we were receiving hits months in advance of the releases they this were actually put. This, this is something that only Yugi boomers will understand and relate to, because the system is something that you would look at from the outside and you would be like, that does not make any sense. Because up until this point, like he's saying, we had the same ban list as the OCG. We had the same ban list as the OCG, even though our card pool was shifted for like months. Like we got the cards months later. We still played under the same forbidden limited list. Uh, there were cards that we didn't even get altogether, like OCG exclusives that we did. The, we got at random times. It, it, it made no sense. It made no sense. So this was the time. And I don't know how long 
Konami TCG had to fight in order to be to gain the ability to make their own ban lists, but uh, they uh, they eventually got the approval for it, and now from this point on, I mean, eh, that was a good decision. In place four, starting with this ban list, the TCG and OCG would officially split. Like, don't get me wrong, I would still prefer. I think if we had the same card pool as the OCG, like if TCG and OCG were the same, I would prefer that. Um, but if they have to be separate for whatever reason, um, I would prefer to have my own ban list too, please, because I don't want to have a ban list for, for another game that's already two months ahead of myself, uh, of my own game, you know, apply to my game. It makes no sense. Each other. With the TCG now updating their ban list completely separately from the OCG, commonly referred to as the TCG OCG split in the player base. Ironically, this would also be the largest ban list in the history of the game so far, seeing 15 bans, 18 limits, 5 semi limits, and 9 unlimited. <laughs> 15 bans! Wait, can I? There's no way I get them all together. There's no shot. Spellbook of Judgment was, was one of them. Um. Super Rejuve? It limits all the... No, it bans... Oh, four baby dragons. Four baby dragons. Uh, so that's six. You said 15? The hell? Shock oh, Shockmaster. Shockmaster, right? I Total of 47 changes in all. So let's dive 47. in. Newly banned were the four baby rulers yeah. in Super Rejuvenation, yeah. directly targeted at kneecapping dragon rulers. Elemental hero Stratos... Oh, Stratos. Dude, Stratos did nothing wrong, let's be honest. <laughs> various hero beat decks. Number 16, Shockmaster. That makes the sense. final nail in the coffin for wind-up. Card destruction. The power play card uh, of Dark Worlds. Gateway of the Six. Putting an end to Six Samurai. <laughs> good. Very good. Pop-up nature. Heavy Storm. Monster Reborn. Right, right, Avarice, and Solemn right. Judgment. Hits to the meta staples. Spellbook of Judgment. Killing the modern iteration of spellbooks yep. outright. Mm -hmm. And Ultimate Offering. A spam summon card that hadn't caused many issues yet, but was clearly a ticking time bomb. Newly limited were Atlantean Dragoons and Deep Sea Diva as hit to the Atlantean. Fire See, they did something that was very good, which was they made preemptive hits on this thing, right? This was overall, I think, a very well thought out ban list because they were like, okay, we're going to hit Dragon Ruler and Spellbook, but we're not going to call it a day there because if we do that, we're just going to go back to Mermaid format completely. The Spirit as a hit to three axis. Constellar Ptolemy M7 and Evagishki Mind August hits to a Gishki loop. Dulorent to prevent more loops. Genex Ally Birdman as a staple tuner. Rescue Rabbit, the cornerstone of various rank 4 strategies. Thunder King Ryo, Dimensional Fissure, Royal Tribute, Eradicator Epidemic Virus, Macrocosmos, and Soul Drain, all as hits to stun decks. Gold Sarcophagus as a hit to Dragon Rulers, and Bottomless, Compulse, and Torrential as hits to the staple trap line. Newly semi limited were Tenki, a hit to Beast Warrior decks. Dimensional Prison, a hit to the staple trap. And Mizuki. Okay, limiting Deep Prison after Dragon Ruler format is. That's crazy. <laughs> While you're in Dragon Ruler format and people resolve, like, uh, you know. <laughs> Spellbook of Judgment as well. Hitting Dimensional Prison on your list is that that's that's outrageous. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll say that that was too much. <laughs> you didn't need to hit Dimensional Prison. <laughs> Plague Spreader and TG Striker all coming back from one. Lastly, Unlimited were Destiny Hero Malicious, The Agent of Mystery Earth, Sukiyomi, A Hero Lives, Black Whirlwind, E Emergency Call, Erratic Seal of Convocation, Pot of Duality, and Scapegoat being a wave of cleanup. Needless to say, something was bound to change here, but on reveal, even though a lot was hit, there were glaring omissions. Even though the rulers lost the babies, Rejuve, and two of their gold sarks, the deck remained shockingly competent with all four rulers still legal at three copies each. And now that spellbooks were out of the way, there was no deck to really stand up against them. YCS Brussels would be held the same day as this list, though notably wouldn't be affected by it due to being a sealed pack no, YCS using the new war. Not the YCS Brussels, man! I've, I've told this story before. This is the one where I lost in top eight. Because I, uh, this was the battle pack one, so sealed, battle pack two, I think, at the time. This is the one where in top eight, I lost, because, like, my opponent, game three, my opponent has scapegoat tokens, and is on, like, 3,000 life points. I have a monster in attack position, and a, I have a trap card that f changes the battle position of all the monsters. I forgot the name. Uh, and I... I draw, I, I'm like, I, I need to draw a monster here and I can turn the, the scapegoat tokens to attack position and I win the game. And I draw a monster and I get way too excited and I normal summon it first. Oh man, I normal summon it first. Because in, in that format, no, it was zero gravity. Because Windstorm of Etaqua, 
I believe, only changes the position of your opponent's monsters. Hold up. I'll, 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 I'll verify that. Windstorm of Itaqua. Yeah, exactly. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. So, Windstorm of Itaqua changes the position of only your opponent's monsters. And the other card is called Zero Gravity. And my deck had both. Because they were both really good in, um, in that format. My deck had both. And I, 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 don't know, I don't know if I thought I had Windstorm. Or if I just mistook one card for the other. But I Normal Summoned first. Then used the Trap card. Which changed my monster to defense. And then I, I couldn't attack for game. And then I got, I, I've never been punished for a misplay so hard in my entire life. There's a few misplays that I've done that have been punished. But in that situation, it was like my opponent was then down to like a thousand life points. Still had like no cards in hand or something. Had like two scapegoat tokens left or something. And ended up top decking like, because it was battle pack format. Ended up top decking like graceful charity into a magician of faith that added back pot of greed from the graveyard into like a crazy sequence. And I lost the game. And I was so tilted, man, because I just told you the story like 30 minutes ago, how I, 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 I was trying to get top four at a YCS and I didn't do it at YCS Lil. I lost in top eight and then in YCS Brussels, I lost in top eight to that shit. Oh my God, it was tilting. But it's part of the, it's part of the development, I suppose. You know, you got to go through this kind of stuff. There's no shortcut. Science draft pack. These YCSs are always happen. the more interesting to cover thanks to dispelling the rumor that drafting is all luck when in reality it is heavily built What do you mean, Graceful and Pot of Greed? This is sealed format. This was a draft YCS where you got battle packs and you built your deck out of that. And Pot of Greed and Graceful were in that battle pack. So you could get them. On the back of deck building skill, which we'd see thanks to the finals being between some of EU's most consistent faces at the time, being Peter Gross and Michael Gruner, with Gruner taking the event in a 2-1 finals match, claiming the YCS title and the first copy of the newest YCS prize card, number 106 Giant Hand. This particular prize card reveal was a little controversial, as in recent years the prize card has been decent, but not something you'd really want to play in a meta deck, as compared to the SJC days where prize cards were extremely meta relevant and caused many issues in pricing. This time though, Giant Hand, while not the strongest rank 4 out there, did fill a niche in the rank pool by providing monster effect negation, leaning it to actually see play during its prize card stint you think a draft YCS is good? I don't want to go into too much detail, but I, I think, I, I personally think it's very fun. Um... And I think it has a lot of advantages, like people not having to invest a lot of money to, to play, right? It would eliminate that factor. But judging from the numbers of attendance back then, I understand why they don't do them anymore, because the YCSs weren't that big. So on the one hand, I think it's super fun. On the other hand, I understand that, you know, they want to attract as many people as possible. So and from that standpoint, they just weren't that special. So I don't know. Run, much to the horror of budget players. Giant Hand was, it was very annoying to, that it was a playable uh, price card. Like I've said this in the Anotherverse discussion that, that's, that's been held when they announced literal vanillas uh, for price cards. But I personally think a, a YCS price card should do nothing but look sick uh, and like not actually be meta relevant. Uh, and Giant Hand was like, Giant Hand, the problem with Giant Hand was it was borderline playable. Like, it wasn't broken, obviously, but it was also not bad. So there were scenarios where you were looking at your deck and you were like, I, I think this card should be here, right? Um, but it was obviously a freaking YCS price card, so that was a problem. YCS Toronto would be held the same day, and this event would paint a much more clear picture of the meta fallout, with there being no real top deck following the hit. Dragon Seeing Ruler a new Plants, of Dragon I remember Rulers, that. That being Dragon Ruler Plants, rise into the top meta position, though not in a convincing manner. The deck had pivoted to focus more on the synchro pool axis that had been experimented with prior, adding in more tuners than just the odd level ones this Is this time. just before people figured out Ravine Rulers was the way to go? I assume. I'm like the Bree Dragon, in addition to the level modulating I don't remember tuners this like deck. Score, giving you access to the level 11 pool for Star Eater. Spellbooks would pivot back to their own boss monsters for an end game, such as High Priestess and World, giving the deck a far different feel than it had pre ban list. Spellbook, unironically, was actually still fine. Like, that deck was okay. Uh, it was just... Judgment overshadowed the natural ability of the deck to actually grind and win. Like, you just didn't need to worry about any of it if you could just go plus five. 
Dragoonity Ruler would be the other interesting development here, leaning hard into the recently discovered Dragon Ravine to not only fuel the rulers, but also to access the level 8 Synchro Pool easily through Ducks and Phalanx, making it the top 4 here. Edward Kuang would take the event on a more pure variant of Dragon Rulers, though yeah. notably still playing Dandelion from the plant package, just not the rest of it, also leaning into the Dragon Ravine discovery himself. Though the top cut here feels a lot more diverse than it was before, in reality 7 of the top 16 were just different flavors of ruler, showing that despite the hits, nothing had really changed about them being the best deck, with the only question being which variant to play. And another variant was about to throw their hat into the ring with the next structure deck releasing two weeks later. Okay. Nah, this, I mean... Blue Eyes? No. Saga of Blue Eyes White That Dragon. hat, they, maybe they tried to throw their hat in the ring, but the hat landed like, like friggin' 15 meters outside of the ring. That's maybe what they tried. Release date, September 13th, 2013. They didn't hit the Set ring, type, they missed structure it. Deck. Major strategies, Blue Eyes. Impact, another variant on the pile. Saga of Blue Eyes was an interestingly timed structure deck, releasing a wave of new support for Blue Eyes and general dragon support right at a time when dragons were more popular than ever. For Blue Eyes specifically, they received Maiden with Eyes of Blue, a tuner that, if attacked, <laughs> summoned a Blue Eyes White Dragon from hand, deck, or grave, negates the attack, and swaps her battle position. And if targeted, summons a Blue Eyes as well, being a casual player's worst nightmare, requiring non-targeted, non-battle removal, or the ability to- Yeah, the problem with this card is that you have to read it if you want to out it. That's the biggest issue. That's why the Yu-Gi-Oh! community hates this card. Because uh, it comes down, it has a lot of lines of text, and if you don't know what's on it, you, you might think you can just attack it or something like that, you know? ...to deal with both her and the dragon she summons. They also received Azure Eyes Silver Dragon, a level 9 synchro requiring a normal monster non-tuner that gives dragons you control card effect targeting and destruction prevention on summon, and can revive a normal monster during each of your standby phases, being clearly intended as a boss for Blue Eyes specifically, but being extremely niche in its applications. Outside of Blue Eyes' specific support, the deck also brought Silver's Cry, a revival spell for dragon normal monsters, and Dragon Shrine, a foolish burial for dragon dragons that can win two dragons if the first one was Dragon a Shrine one. was also, Dragon Shrine was unironically good in Dragon Rulers. Sometimes, I mean, it was better, it was a better foolish burial because we played vanilla dragons anyways in flamvel guard uh you would basically get to send two dragon monsters with one card which meant extra material for your dragon ruler so like even though losing your flamvel guard from your deck wasn't always ideal which is why i don't think people i don't i don't think you would always play multiples of this card sometimes you wouldn't even play it but like it was a viable card for that reason Monster. Silver's Cry would fall into an extremely niche position on release, but Dragon Shrine would actually see some experimentation in yep. Dragon Ruler specifically thanks to it being able to bend two dragons at once, as the deck already played a normal monster usually in Flamvel Guard to access the Rewatched. double bend effect, though this would be niche for a time. Reprints here included Heratic Dragon of Tefnuit, Trade In, Cards of Consonance, One for One, Monster Reborn, which had just been banned, Fiendish Chain, and Compulse, being a decent wave of staple reprints and useful tools. Following two weeks later would be another first of its kind set, being the Judgment of the Light Deluxe Edition, which is effectively an upgraded version of the previous special editions, but notably held printings of two cards that would be coming in the next core set, being Dragon Shield and Vampire Kingdom, though neither of these cards would be useful. YCS San Mateo would be held a week after that on October 6th, and clearly Dragon Merlin. Ruler had once again fully taken over, seeing 12 total top spots between its pure and Trinity variants, taking first place piloted yep. by Merlin Schumacher on a more pure variant. The Ravine inclusion was no longer a tech, it was now a staple in every version of the deck, marking what would become known as Ravine Ruler format for the remainder of the year, but that distinction was about to get worse. We had another Legendary Collection release coming in the next week, and though it appeared to be unassuming, it was about to bring something down on the format that would cause the next two months of the game The disqualification some... here was so funny, but it wasn't relevant to include- wait, which one? What happened? I don't know that story. Maybe I remember if you dropped me a, if you dropped me a, a hint, but I don't remember that story. What was that about? Back up to the pie chart. Back to the pie chart we go. Oh, one dis- Oh, because it says one disqualification down here. Okay, I didn't see that. A player was DQ'd between top 32 and 16. Okay. So why is that, why is that funny? He wrote Swagatic instead of Hieratic on his deck list. <laughs> There's no way. I've never heard of that story. What? There's no shot. Wait, that's the that's the reason they wrote swag and tick instead of hieratic on it. <laughs> that's so funny, man. What? 
<laughs> That's not real. That's not real. Is that real? <laughs> oh God! Swaggeting seals of the hair of the heavenly spheres, man. What? <laughs> Imagine. Oh man! Imagine. That is so funny. Okay, that is actually that might be the funniest disqualification to ever happen. If that's true. <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> Swag. Legendary Collection 4 Joey's World. Release date October 11th, 2013. Set type <laughs> reprint set. Major strategies anything touched by Joey in the original anime. Impact no. one import that should have stayed out. No, not six Legendary cents. Collection Joey's World is an odd release in retrospect, much like a lot of this year in the game, bringing reprints of a bunch of older DM era cards, many of which are banned, just like Yugi's World before it, but also importing a single OCG card far after its ban in the OCG, which we'll talk about shortly. First of all, the reprints. Jinzo, Fiber Jar, Red Eyes Wyvern, Red MD, Raigeki, Monster Reborn, Pot of Greed, Giant Trunade, Premature Burial, Scapegoat, Foolish Burial, Bottomless, Feather Duster, Lava Golem, Mirror Force, Solemn Judgment, The Dark World Core, Necro Valley, Heavy Storm, MST, Rhoda, Super Rejuve, Book of Moon, Pot of Avarice, Trade In, Torrential, Compulse, and Imperial Iron Wall would all be reprinted here, with most of these already being banned in the current format. However, Joey's World also released a card that's been banned for years now that was finally imported from the OCG, being Sixth Sense, a trap that lets you call two results on a die, roll it, and if it's the number you called, you draw. The card also accurately depicts your opponent's um, response when you activate this card. This is how every single one of your opponents looked when you flipped over this card, which is it's one of the only Yu-Gi-Oh cards to do that, to not only be incredibly broken, but also encapsulate your opponent's look on its artwork that many cards, otherwise milling the result. This card had been banned in the OCG since March of 2005, and when it was printed here, we all expected that that would hold. However, Konami apparently had a different idea. On October 11th, the same day as Joey's World's release, Sixth Sense was put to Limited on the TCG- Okay. Chat. We're gonna have a discussion with no winners now. Declare two numbers from one to six, then your opponent rolls a six-sided die, and if the result is one of the numbers you declared, you draw that many cards. Otherwise, send the number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard equal to the result. What do you call if you're playing Dragon Rulers? Go. Which are the two numbers you call? So, <laughs> the... The fun, the fun thing about this question is that if you're playing a deck, so there's two outcomes, right? You either draw that many cards or you mill um, a number of cards of whatever you didn't call, right? And so in any deck where milling doesn't do you anything good, you will always go for five or six because, you know, if, if you always have the same chance of hitting for the draws. So you might as well shoot as high as you can. And if you hit, you draw five or six cards, right? Um, but in a deck like Dragon Rulers, where milling cards would actually um, benefit you sometimes, like milling cards also had some value. Like you can think of it of like, you know, drawing two cards is always plus two, right? Like Or like plus one, rather. If you activate Pot of Greed, that's a plus one because you get two new cards, right? Milling cards is, is, a little dif is a little more difficult to evaluate because if I mill five cards in Dragon Rulers, how much is that worth? You know, like on average, is that is that worth zero cards? Is that worth one card, two, three, um, so on and so forth, right? And so in Dragon Rulers back then, there was a there was a basically a discussion going on, and people would disagree like crazy on what number you would call with six cents. People were like, just call five six, just call five six, and and try to draw as many cards as possible. Um, some people would even call like two or three because they would say like, if I call two or three. Um, I can either just go plus by drawing two or three cards, which is good enough for me. But if I miss, unless it's a one, uh, if I call if I if I call uh, two and three, and it's like it's not a one. If it's four, five, six, I mill a decent chunk of cards, still making the card worth it, right? Um, so on and so forth. So I I personally I think I called three and four, with the reasoning being if you call three and four, you are drawing three or four cards is more than enough to win the game usually, right? Um, in any neutral game state, like unless your opponent is Omega winning and you need to draw specific outs to a situation, then you would call five or six. But like in a normal game state, I would call three or four because drawing three or four cards in a normal game state would win you the game, right? On, on a five or six, 
milling five or six cards in a in a neutral game state was also very likely to win you the game um meaning you had two thirds of of a chance to 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 get a really good outcome um kind of minimizing because one or two is always going to be bad no matter what right um in a deck like modern tier limits unironically you would probably call uh, like one or two or something like that because milling three four five six is insane uh but yeah i don't know i was on the i was on the uh verge of calling i i called three or four with this because i i thought drawing three or four is enough and milling five or six is pretty good so you minimize bad outcomes and then there was like weird people that would come around the corner and be like yeah you obviously called two and four uh, or two and five or something like that like <laughs> two and call three and six uh whatever like i don't know people had the wildest theories for what you should call with six cents which i never understood the reasoning behind calling something like three and six or something like that like i think it just depends on how much value your deck gets from milling a lot because if you get a lot of value from milling a lot you should just call some you should leave five or six to be the milling outcomes basically <laughs> Two or two to two and three is fair. Two and three is fair. If you, I think two and three is the lowest risk option in a deck that plays a lot of good mills because you can you can go like if I draw two cards, it's still a plus one. If I draw three, it's really good. If I mill four, five, six, it's solid. So two and three or four or two three, I understand. Three four, I preferred. Um, everything else, I never really um went for because I feel like when you go act when you call five and six with this. In most scenarios, it's like two thirds for it to be bad and one third for it to be completely insane, um, which on average I don't think is better, or like it's it's more it's a lot of variance at least. Be banless, meaning that. By the way, the correct answer is uh, you should call for this card to be banned. So you were all wrong. The the correct answer was um, you should call for this card to be banned. At, at least until the next ban list, the card was legal to use in the TCG. And I'm sure that that won't cause any kind of issues having a draw 5 or 6 or mill 1 to 4 in a format dominated by a deck that loves to play out of the graveyard. Just two weeks after this, Weekly Shonen Jump Alpha would finally release a promo worth talking about this year, being Vulcan the Divine, a level 6 synchro that bounces a card you control and a card the opponent controls on synchro summon, locking you from using that bounce card for the rest of the turn, being a clause clearly placed on it to prevent loops. This would be a solid inclusion to the level 6 synchro pool moving forward, not quite becoming I mean, this was mainly good for three axis fire fist at some point, but we didn't have it in the, in in Europe, I think, because it was a jump promo. So we, I never got to play with this card being relevant. Staple, but remaining a solid. But it's a really include. cool card. YCS London would be held three days after that on October twenty seventh, and what? And who would have guessed? This was, I think, the first time I made top four at a YCS in Ravine. Dude, ruler format. I was on fire during ruler format. Um, I lost in top four of this event to a six cents drawing five cards. Now would you look at that? Dragon Rulers had fully gone into overdrive with six cents becoming lethal, completely dominating the event and taking first place piloted by Patrick Ryder, with almost every publicly available list playing the new trap tool. On a much less important note, following that performance was the 5D's manga volume five release, which brought a new take on a classic synchro, being Stardust Spark Dragon, a level I eight did show your list, Wink. Oh, destroy... did you show the, oh, uh, I know which one you would show. Yeah, 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 I know which one. A turn on a quick effect, yeah, yeah, that's next one. That's next, next Stardust, YCS, covering though. a more general spread of circumstances. This would lead us into the last set release of the year, Year, and any hope for Dragon Ruler's reign ending anytime soon would have to rest on its shoulders. Ooh, Felgrand. Shadow uh... Spectres. Release date, November 7th, 2013. Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, Ghost Trick, Bujin, Noble Knight. Impact, nothing until the beast is dropped. Shadow Spectres was the final set release of 2013, and if it wanted to change anything... Wait, this has the... this has... Three dragon and water dragon, right? It really had the wrong card pool to do it, as this particular release would do nothing to the meta overall, merely setting up archetypes for their next waves. Starting with the headliner of the set, Ghost Trick was a series of fiends, spellcasters, and zombies focused on disruption and flipping cards face down, aimed at winning via a war of attrition in a way, with most main deck monsters sharing an effect to flip themselves face down once per turn. I loved your Madrid feature where you double cycloned emptiness. Well, I mean, the the the, the list he's talking about is not the double cyclone, because that's 2014. This introduction wave included Lantern, able to summon itself from hand face down if the opponent attacks directly or attacks a ghost trick, negating the attack. Spectre, able to summon- But you're right, that's probably, um, that's the most memorable feature match moment from YCS Madrid. You're right, yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's definitely, that is the most memorable feature match, the uh, thing that happened on a feature match in that YCS.
itself from hand face down if a ghost trick is that's destroyed. Just, that's just say it like that. You do. Zhangxi, able to search a ghost trick on flip, whose level is less than or equal to your total number of face-up ghost tricks. Alucard, a rank 3 that can detach to pop a set card on field. Mansion, a field spell that blocks attacking face down monsters and halves battle damage from non-ghost trick monsters. And Scare, able to flip any number of your monsters up, then flip monsters the opponent controls face down up to the number of ghost tricks you control. Ghost tricks here would be considered a fun casual level option. I mean, ghost tricks... Let's face it, ghost tricks are pretty ass, but their extra deck cards are pretty good. Even nowadays, you still play them in like pearly. But at, at the time, Alucard was the only really good one. But would be nowhere near strong enough to enter the meta, with their most relevant piece being Alucard as a contribution to the rank 3 stable pool. Bujin would receive its second main deck Beast Warrior in Mikazushi, able to summon itself from hand if a Beast Warrior Bujin is destroyed, able to search a Bujin spell trap in the end phase if a Bujin was sent from hand to grave that turn while you controlled it. And Kakutsuchi, a Beast Warrior locked rank 4 that can mill 5 on summon, boosting by 100 for each Bujin milled, able to prevent the destruction of a Beast Warrior Bujin by detaching a material. Just the inclusion of a second main deck Beast Warrior Bujin would increase the power of the deck significantly, though it was still unable to perform well in the Dragon Ruler dominated environment. Noble Knights would receive another solid couple of cards and Boars, who was able to become level 5 while equipped with a Noble Arms card, and can reveal 3 Noble Arms in deck to add one at random to hand and put the rest in grave. And Sacred Noble Knight of King or Torgus, a Noble Knight- I swear to god, didn't we see exactly this card like, uh, 30 minutes ago? There, <laughs> this, I, I, I could swear it was this exact same card. Knight locked rank 5 that equips up to 3 Noble Arms from grave to itself on summon, can detach one to pop a monster on field, and floats into a Noble Knight in grave on destruction. With this release, Noble Knight- That's Knights the rank 5? Was the other one the- no, I'll, no, I, I'll- I, I'd rather- no, I'm living in a reality where it's the same card. It doesn't matter. It's the same. Finally had a solid line to access on it's turn It's the same. One, with Madrat into Boars giving access to the rank 5 pool thanks to Boars grabbing another Noble Arms spell to make Madrat level 5 again. While competent now, Noble Knight would still not be meta, but with this release, the evolution of the TCG exclusive archetype's development process was on display, showing growth in their design space, now aimed at releasing batches of about 5 cards per core set for the current TCG exclusive archetype. While it was too late for Noble Knights to be saved, realistically, it gave hope for the next TCG exclusive Did this set have the vampires? Well, we already looked at Vampire Kingdom or something like that in some side set earlier, so vampires were already out. I don't know. I've... Shadow Spectre sounds like the correct set to put the vampires in. I'm not... I, it yes, sounds like the one. As for some of the other releases here, Labadorite Dragon was another level 6 normal dragon for the Heratic Pool, giving the pool a tuner to use for their strategy. Mythic Tree and Water Dragons were a duo clearly intended to work with each other, with Water summoning itself if you control an Earth Monster. They were also pretty clearly designed to work with Dragon Rulers, because there's not that many Water Dragons and Earth Dragons that they made, and then, like, coincidentally making these two in that year, it was pretty much meant to be a Dragon Ruler a way of playing the dragon ruler deck um so like you would just have to all you had to do was assemble both of these and you would get a rank eight um because mythic tree dragon can make itself level eight if you have mythic water dragon um it can even make itself level seven if you have a title so this card was generally like the, the cards were okay but I don't think it was the best version of Dragon Rulers that played those cards, but they were they were viable. And Tree able to copy the level of a Water Dragon you control to itself, giving access to a rank 8 by themselves. These would be experimented with in Dragon Rulers, as they could access the rank 8 pool, but also Tree could copy the level of a title onto itself for an additional rank 7 access point. The Baby Raccoon cards would also be released here, being Ponpoko, able to summon a level 2 beast from deck face down on normal summon, Tantan, who summons a level 2 beast from deck on flip, and number 64, Ronin Raccoon Sendayu, a beast locked rank 2 that can These detach cool. to summon a Kagemusha Raccoon token that matches the attack of the strongest it's monster a very on the cool field archetype. on summon, preventing itself from destruction while you control another beast, being a solid budget rogue level deck to play around with. Divine Dragonite Felgrand was a rank 8 that could detach on quick effect to make a monster unaffected by other effects that turn, negating its own effects, being a powerful rank 8 option for the pool. Mistake was a continuous trap that locked adding cards from deck to hand outside of drawing, being a solid... Hmm... I hate to say it, but I have really no other way of putting it. But mistake was also a mistake. Side deck floodgate for certain matchups. Grizzale Prison, if you control the fusion, ritual, or tribute summoned monster, locks players from synchro and exceed summoning until the end of the opponent's next turn, being an extremely powerful floodgate option for certain strategies. Lastly, White Dragon Wyver Burster and Black Dragon Collapse Surfer oh. are OCG imports that can summon themselves by banishing right. the other attribute from grave, searching the other when sent to grave, being decent options for chaos strategies, not seen playing now, but would be heavily considered in the future. Two weeks later would be the second wave of the yearly collectible tens, bringing secret rare versions of Tempest and Redox to finish out the series, alongside super rare reprints of Thunder Seahorse, Gear Geek and Tex, number 50 Black Ship of Corn, Diamond Dire Wolf, and Spellbook of the Master, reprinting some of the more valuable secret rares. I'm pretty sure Black Ship of Corn wasn't in, in Europe before this.
I might be wrong though. ...in the format in a much easier to access rarity and location. YCS Turin would follow a week after this on December 1st. Being the this, final is, this is where you're going to show my list. This is this is where you're going to show my list. Dude, and ironically, I was on fire in 2013. Uh, I... This was... Uh, I made top four at this one as well. ...CS of the year. And once and again, this list Dragon was pretty Ruler cool. Dominate thanks to the combination of Ravine and Six. Top four and yeah, I never, I never won in 2013. It was sad. That honor would go to Samuel Padigo on Karakuri Girgia, utilizing similar strategies to before, but now having added in the Girgia. Now for this, for this, I have uh, no explanation. How this won? It was not my fault. I lost to the other person in top four. Like the other finalists, I, it was, I, I did not do this. I did not. I'm not responsible for this whatsoever. Auto monsters with Girgia gear to flood the board and access the rank wars rapidly. Also utilizing a single copy of Redox as an extra body and a monster reborn of sorts. As for other developments here, Influence Dragon would begin to appear. In this is my list. Yeah. The oh, this list was so cool. Oh, I loved some of the discoveries. That the Influence Dragon was my idea. The so Influence Dragon. Uh, Influence Dragon was a so the whole deck revolved a lot around the different levels of tuners and the breed dragon target and card of consonant targets and stuff like that and uh i i had the idea of hey what if we play a level three dragon tuner that you can discard for card of consonants and search with a dragon ruler uh that is also a debris dragon target because then we can make trident dragon um which can then pop you know, our Dragon Ravine or our... Does Trident Dragon pop cards or monsters? I don't remember. You can definitely pop your Debris Dragon. Uh, and maybe also the, the Dragon Ravine. I think it's cards. Maybe it's monsters. I don't remember. And it makes for very, very easy OTKs. And that was also why we played the Vine Wrath over some other discard traps. Because you would just OTK the opponent under Scarecrow and stuff like that. Um, it was a pretty cool... It was a pretty cool list for, the, for, uh, for at the time. Um... I was, I, was, I was pretty proud of it at the time. The, the Dragon Influence Ruler Dragon Discovery. Speak. The Trigon was another thing. People just played Trigon because it was the... It was a... Um, a level 3 target for the Bree Dragon that you could also use like with Blaster and all that. And you would just be able to make... Because it was very important to be able to make Ancient Fairy Dragon with um, the Bree Dragon. Um, because that was one of the core setup things on the first turn. You would start the Bree Dragon um, after Ravine. Like, Ravine sends Trigon. The Bree Dragon brings back Trigon, makes Ancient Fairy. Ancient Fairy pops your Ravine for another Ravine, um, and so on and so forth. Very often, because <laughs> this is one of the funnest things about this Dragon Ruler um, format, this still was when you could only have one field spell on the board. So it was a lot about canceling your opponent's ravine with your own ravine. It was like a field spell war kind of situation, right? And it was very fun. It introduced a lot of skill into the format because Ancient Fairy Dragon could make it so you can pop your opponent's ravine to get your own, but then on the first turn, there was also this other dimension of plays. Like you can either, you can pop your own ravine and then activate the next one to fill your graveyard up more. Or you can um, you can pop your own ravine to get a follow-up ravine and not use it immediately to be able to have a counter to your opponent's ravine next turn, right? So basically, um, getting rid of the ravine on your field so that your opponent can't destroy it for free, have a backup one in hand. So when your opponent goes ravine, you can you have a way, you have a free removal for it next turn to get down your own ravine and so on and so forth right um it was a very fun format it was a very fun format um uh also sitting on ancient fairy dragon was one of the better ways to do uh, like one of the better things to do when you got max seed like just make fa fairy dragon search back up ravine sit on a 3k fairy dragon it's calm like usually fine um it was a it was a very fun back and forth format arguably um Arguably more fun than the full power Dragon Ruler one. Um, a pretty damn cool format. Six cents and Return ruin it a little bit. Ruin it a little bit. Although Return was one of the most hated cards at the time, I will say Return would actually not take that much skill out of the format because 
good players would have more ways to play around return than than bad players usually like it it was it was astonishing how often um return would not help the worst player win or how much like how how often it felt like when you were the better player anyways you didn't need return to um do it but this was also the first um i want to say the first iteration of a quote unquote gentleman's agreement where um, I remember whenever I played against people that I knew at the time, um, it was a very common thing to be like, hey, do you want to side out six cents and return for game two and three? And both players would do it, right? Um, that was a very common thing at the time, which obviously uh, backfired in Necros format. <laughs> the fact that this was, this was the first time I remember something like this uh, being the case. A level 3 tuner allowing access to Trident Dragion for sudden OTK pushes. Bujin would see a top here sporting Kaiser Coliseum to even the playing field a bit, able to comfortably sit on just Yamato for turns on end thanks to locking swarming from the opponent. Mythic Wood and Water Dragon would make- Isn't that considered collusion? I don't know. It was, it was a thing in... It was normal back then. And then during Necros format, it was something that Patrick Hoban did with... Um, with the Jin, right? But th the thing is, with Return and Sixth Sense, both were limited. So if you could see your opponent's Return and Sixth Sense, um, the uh, it was like obvious that they had taken them out. But with um, with Jin, what Patrick Hoban did was he would show his show his opponent the the Jin, right? That he would side out, but he had a second one in the side deck that he would side in, right? And I I think at the time. This was a normal thing, but after the the Jin thing happened, they they said that uh, they 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 added it to the policy document to not do it. Um, during this format, it never caused a problem. No one cared about it. Pretty much, like if two people wanted to do it, and then whatever, like you know, do it. Um, I don't think it's a problem. But uh, after the Jin thing, I I I I I saw that it was a problem there, and then they just put it into the policy that you can't do it anymore. So. Whatever. The occasional appearance here in list to access the rank 8 pool for Dragon Rulers, specifically for Heliopolis, Giant Grinder, and the newly released Felgrand. And with that... And you tell us the incident? I just told you the incident. It was that Patrick Coben had uh, Jin in his main deck, and it was a very common thing during Necros format, because Jin took a lot of skill out of Necros mirrors. It was a very common thing that people would ask, hey, do you want to side out, do, do you agree to both of us side out their Jin? Um, which was usually a one-off in 99.9% .9 of the decks, right? And so you would just both side out the Jin um, and play game two and three without Jin lock, right? And what Patrick Hoban did was uh, he thought he was extra smart and he had a second Jin in his side deck because what what, what would happen is um, there were a lot of cards in the Necros deck that were dedicated to outing your opponent's Jin lock, right? Uh, whatever, books, uh, Dark Hole, DD Warrior Lady, whatever, you name it. People played out to the Jin lock, um, and they weren't normally very good in the Necros mirror. So what would happen is, if both players agreed to out side out Jin, people would also take out the outs to the Jin lock, right? People would side out the cards that would um, out the Jin lock, and um, and then Patrick Hoban sided in a second Jin, which uh, at the time sparked an outrage, but wasn't against the rules. Um, so you can think of it whatever you will. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave that completely up to you. I, I, I don't want to comment on it. Um, but after that happened, uh, they, they added it to the policy that you can't do these sort of things. Uh, like just in general, they just removed this sort of, um, uh, gentleman's agreement kind of thing, right? Like you just, uh, you just can't do it anymore. And Yu-Gi-Oh would come to an end, seeing a bit of a shocking outcome for those who view these formats as tier zero, as a very interesting result has come to my attention while researching this period. I've long stood as someone who said that the original Dragon Ruler format was not a tier zero format, and looking back on the results now, that is true. Prior to any hits, Dragon Ruler only took 31% of the representation in full, 52.5% when adjusted with the unknown list remove, which is far below the standard 65% threshold most tier zero formats are qualified by. However, a very interesting result occurs when you analyze the result of Dragon Ruler's post Sixth Sense release. Of the top 64 spots available in the YCS's following Sixth Sense's release, Dragon Ruler no. variants took a shocking no. 65. I would also argue that Dragon Ruler spellbook format was not a tier zero format simply because by definition it couldn't be because there were just spellbook was too powerful for dragon ruler to be tier zero simple as that 
which it doesn't really matter which kind of tag you put onto a format. It doesn't really matter. Dragon Ruler's power level doesn't change if you call it a, one, a tier zero format or uh, Dragon Spellbook format or whatever. The deck remains the same. Uh, it's only a classification problem, I suppose, and there isn't even a clear classification for what's tier zero. But I personally wouldn't call um, 2013 Dragon Ruler Spellbook format a tier zero format. It's a very high power level format that basically only has two decks. Which together, uh, I basically the way I look at it is Dragon Ruler and Spellbook, I view them as one, one entity and together they're tier zero, right? That, the power level of these two decks is far beyond everything else. Um, so they kind of make up the tier zero portion of any sort of tier list you could make for that time, right? They are by far the best above the rest, right? Um, I think Dragon Ruler was better than Spellbook, um, but that's also arguable. People argue with that a lot for some reason, but it's it's okay. Um, both of those decks, incredibly powerful. After the ban list that banned the baby uh, dragons, it was incredibly obvious that the Dragon Rulers were still completely broken and Spellbook of Judgment was gone. So arguably after that ban list, you could argue Dragon Rulers were tier zero. There were... Um, decks that could compete. You know, I remember people playing Evil Swarm a decent amount still. Um, Spellbook without Judgment was still a viable strategy. People went back to Mermail a little bit, I think. Um, Bujin was something that people messed around with. I don't remember exactly what else people would play. But I'm going to be honest with you, um, Dragon Ruler after, um, after the Baby Dragons got hit, after that huge ban list, they were the king of that format. I think I think it was tier zero at the time. You could call it that for sure. 5.6% of the representation. 76.4% if you adjust for the unknown yeah. lists, which is above the threshold regardless of how you look at it. So interestingly enough, Dragon Ruler did have a tier zero format, just not the one everyone claims is the tier zero format, which would be quell. So I think I think Dragon Rulers are I I think the end of 2013 uh, maybe not exactly the end of 2013, but this era of Yu-Gi-Oh! These couple years, right? Um, basically, the end of Zexel. Mm, which I guess also includes 2014, but that's like towards the end of... Uh, what I would say, old school Yu-Gi-Oh! That was a lot of focus on, on grindy games, right? And Dragon Rulers were simply put the king of any sort of grind game you would ever have in the game at the time. There was never a... And that's what made them broken. And that's specifically why um, the Dragon Rulers are also not problematic uh, today anymore. Because the, they still do the exact same thing. The Dragon Rulers would guarantee that you pretty much never run out of resources... Um, and you can unfold their full potential over multiple turns. The thing is, Yu-Gi-Oh! has changed over the last years to a game that is still a very good game, just not as centered around grinding, right? Grinding still happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! But a main focus of a deck is usually not the grind game, which was the case with Dragon Rulers. Dragon Rulers were so good because there was no deck in the game that could outlast them, but there was also no deck in the game that could kill them fast enough because decks simply didn't do that back then, um, most of the time. And um, there is simply... Uh, that kind of game doesn't really um, exist anymore. There's only very few decks that do it. Um, do it like this today. Like I, I guess you could look at Runic as a deck that does that fair. Maybe Labyrinth is a deck that can do that, that also really never runs out of resources, and once it has control over the game, it'll never lose. Um, but the majority of cards, or the majority of decks that have good grind game, are not being played because they have good grind game. They are being played because they are good decks. They Cards need to have more... Cards need to do more things up front, basically, is what I'm trying to say nowadays, right? Because Dragon Rulers, if you look at them from what they do in one turn, is not that much. Because each individual Dragon Ruler only is like, hey, one search, or one summon, or one discard effect, right? That's all they do. That's all a Dragon Ruler does up front, as your first thing that you get when you activate the card. When it gets really crazy is when you do it over multiple turns, right? And it's like, nowadays, I think it's the other way around. Most viable decks or cards nowadays do 
a majority of their work up front on the first activation, right? And the the bonus comes in, a deck becomes really grindy and good in the long term if the cards have like a secondary minor thing that comes in in the long term, right? Stuff like, hey, if I'm in the graveyard, you can banish me to take back a card from the grave or protect the card from being destroyed or add a card back from banished or search a card from your deck, except the turn this card is sent to the graveyard, that kind of stuff, right? That's the, that's the kind of stuff that people, that they put on cards these days as a secondary effect to make decks like useful in the grind game, right? They have a primary effect, which is what they are being played for. And then they have secondary effects to make sure that you don't run out of value, right? Which is the only way they can do it because you wouldn't play cards anymore that are primarily played for the grindy aspect of things. Because one, one great example of this is Pot of Avarice, a card that was so good back in the day um, that doesn't even see play these days anymore because you don't, you don't really want to play cards that, that do nothing immediately, right? You don't get anything. You basically don't get anything up front from Pot of Avarice when you draw your opening hand. That card is essentially a blank, right? You have to work for that card to give you grind game right which is like uh it's it's a problem in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, right that's that's a problem in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. if you have to work for a card to even do anything for you um bef and it does nothing immediately right which uh, that being said it's not necessarily a bad thing because it's it's just in Yu-Gi-Oh. um there's still a lot of gameplay that happens these days uh it just happens within one turn so cards that work over multiple turns by design aren't as strong anymore um but the games the games can still be very good it's just that most of the actions happen in in, in less turns than back in the day which doesn't necessarily make the game worse but it makes cards worse that were designed to work over multiple turns like the dragon rulers did have a tier zero format just not the one everyone claims is the tier zero format which would be quelled going into 2014 but that's a story for another day a huge shout out to my dark all right hey once again very well done the the link to the the video is um is pinned in chat so do me a favor if you enjoyed the watch along if you enjoyed the video make sure to give the law ygo a little bit of a of a subscription or a like on the video um if you if you enjoy the the content make sure to do that and um thank you for making these i can't wait for 2014